Maverick News presents The Rick Walker Show Defrag Your Mind um, Right. Yeah. Are we get, are we ready to bring in our guest? Is he here? He's here. Yay! Let's let's do it. All right. Hello. Hi, Scott. Hello. This is what happens when you invite men who aren't technology technologically savvy and they can't find the link to the show. <laughs> but I found it. <laughs> I'm so glad you did. <laughs> you don't leave us hanging out here. Hey, Scott Ritter's no, coming, and then he, he doesn't, doesn't show eventually. up. <laughs> yeah. If he ever figures out how to turn on his computer. <laughs> Welcome You're a man back. of your word. I Welcome knew you'd back. make it. Great to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah. Wonderful to have you, Scott. Um, I just wanted to start off. You know, we've got this big anti-war rally coming up on Sunday, the Rage Against the War Machine rally in Washington, D.C. And, of course, you were originally slated to speak at this rally. And I was so disappointed to hear that... Uh, they disinvited you or some of the organizers disinvited you. And I just want to clear the air and get that out of the way right off the top and, and let you explain why you won't be speaking on Sunday. Well, I mean, <clears throat> we'll, we'll, we'll just start at the, at the, the beginning. I was invited by uh, uh, a guy named Nick Brana, who is the head of the, the people's party. Nice yeah. guy. Mm -hmm. I, 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 um, <laughs> I mean, I'll be straight up. He and I are not politically aligned. Um, you know, I'm I'm very conservative, and he's very not conservative, which is okay. That's what makes America sure. wonderful. I mean, it's it's not like I'm anti him. It's just that he's very activist minded, et cetera, and I'm not. Um, but he came up. I was doing a a, a book presentation of my uh, my my new book, uh, Disarm at the Time of Perestroika. I love uh, that book, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah. It was a, a book that um, I was suppo originally supposed to give the book uh, presentation at a, at a restaurant called the Russian Samovar. Um, we were modeling it off of um, off a very successful book event. I did at a, 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 a venue in Poughkeepsie, uh, Farmers and Chefs, um, where about 65, 70 people came. They, they bought tickets. The tickets included a book. Um, they came, they had a wonderful dinner. I gave a, uh, I, I spoke, I answered questions and I signed books. And I mean, it was just so much fun that I reached out to the Russian Samovar because uh, when I lived in New York City, um, I actually had developed a very good relationship with the owner. And, um, but he, you know, he died and his uh, daughter-in-law took it over. Uh, good, good lady. So I called up and she said, yeah, no, I'd, uh, we'd like to do it. She said, but you know, let's just keep the presentation about disarmament. Uh, because they've been because of the name Russian Samovar, mm. um, the pro-Ukrainian crowd was trying to shut them down. Can, yep. And so she said, you know, we we're struggling as it is because of the pandemic. We just don't need any hassle. I said, not a problem at all. This will only about be about disarmament. This is pure how, you know, disarmament in the time of perestroika talk. Um, and then um, literally just less than a week before the event was supposed to go down. She, um, I, I, well, a w actually a week prior, I, I gave a presentation here in Del Mar um, at a lot at the local library that um, <laughs> was just supposed to be a small presentation with the local anti-war group. Again, about this situation in Ukraine, uh, Ukrainian activists just decided they were going to hijack the event. And so mm -hmm. things, got a little, things got a little uh, interesting. And um, mm -hmm. the video that was taken by the, um, the videographer of this organization, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. Historically, his best video had like 800 views. Um, this thing had 200,000 views within a week. I mean, it went viral. It did go um, viral. And um, and apparently, um, even though I felt like I held my own and uh, made the case, um, the pro-Ukrainian crowd um, started attacking the Russian Samovar. So they pulled the plug. Oh, and um, and then there's a wonderful guy, uh, Randy Credico. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. Randy. Uh, sure, I know Randy. Yeah, Randy uh, is a is a talk show host at WBAI, mm -hmm. um, and uh, he he was going to come up with a bunch of people from Washington D.C. I guess including Nick, uh, and it was canceled. So he said no, and uh, Randy did Plan B. He found another venue, and we held the event. And uh, at that event, uh, I gave 
my presentation. Now, I've been speaking a long time in public. And so, you know, I guess you can say I'm, I'm fairly practiced and some people would say I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, but the presentation I gave on that Sunday was uh, I knocked it out of the ballpark and I knew halfway through that this was something special. I'm doing some. The sad thing is nobody recorded it, but that's OK. But um, Damn. It, it, <laughs> it was it was a really, really solid presentation. Um, and in the end, I talked about using this book. Disarm the Time of Perestroika. Um, I, I had been thinking uh, a lot with Jeff Norman, the guy I, co I, I collaborate with on uh, Ask the Inspector broadcast and uh, podcast. Jeff and I have known each other for 20 years now. And we've been talking about, hey, what if we took this book, got the book published in Russia, and then I went to Russia and did a book tour in Russia and introduced this concept to the Russian people. What if we captured their reaction on tape and we brought a film crew and did this and we came back and we made a documentary film and then we took it around the country and started to expose Americans to the reality of Russians and how they feel, how they think, how they feel about arms control. And maybe we could get something going and man, maybe we could have a million man March in, uh, in, in central park, like they did in 1982 that broke the back, the freeze on arms control, got the INF treaty. What if we did that again? What if we did something like that? And Jeff, that and I were excited be about awesome. It. Well, but we've so been talking awesome. about it. I was so caught up in this presentation that I blurted it out. I gave it in, in my question and answer. I said, this is what we're going to do. I committed to it. Boom. And Nick Brand came up and he goes, you need to give that presentation at the rally. And I said, what rally? He what said, rally? The big, the big anti-war rally. I said, I don't, Dick, I don't do anti-war rallies anymore. I got burned on Iraq. Um, you know, I got the scars on the palm of my hand. When the burner oh, turns red, I don't put my hands on the burner anymore. Uh, you know, I learned my lesson. Um, I said, no, I, I really don't want to do that. I wish you the best of luck, but I, I don't want to do this. Ah, um, but Nick is very persuasive. Nick, uh, he kept <laughs> coming and it. coming and coming <laughs> and talking about how important his speech was and that yeah. message. that me And I was so caught up having just delivered this message and seeing the reaction. I was getting excited. I said, yeah, okay, I'll go. I'll do the thing. <laughs> but I knew in my heart of hearts it just wasn't going to work out uh, because I am a lightning rod for any yes. number of reasons. And um, if, you know, I have no problem being a lightning rod when people disagree with me. Those are the kind of arguments I like because I'm pretty well prepared. And um, I feel I wouldn't want to debate you. I can hold my own. I, I, <laughs> I, I, I took on Christopher Hitchens, who is uh, yeah. one of the premier masters of the English language. And he is loquacious and eloquent and he uses the right words. And I crushed him on a stage in Terrytown, New York, wiped the floor with the guy. Um, <laughs> so I'll, I'll debate anybody, anytime, anywhere. We can do this. But see, they don't want to have that debate. So they bring up, you know, uh, my past. Um, and my past includes a criminal conviction for um, what they call a, a, a sexual, um, illegal sexual contact with a minor. Hmm. There was never sexual contact with a minor. There was That's never right. a minor. There was, it was a police sting operation where um, under normal circumstances, uh, the, it would never have been brought to the attention. I, I, look, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I mean, I don't want to get, you know, people are interested in the Purient details of it. Mm. Um, here, here, here's here's what I want to tell people. Um, let me destroy your life. Okay, let me let me eliminate your ability to earn a living for, for your family. Let, first of all, let me put you on a crusade that you believe in, that you think is the greatest crusade in the history of the world, that that it can save the world, save lives. Let me get you committed to this crusade. Let me have you put everything into it, years of your life, put into it, thinking you're doing the right thing. And then I'm going to have the government turn on you and destroy you, uh, deny you employment opportunities, attack your family, literally attack your family, attack you. Um, and I'll get you at your lowest possible point where literally um, you're too proud to turn for anybody for help. And then I'm going to put you on the Internet and I'm going to see what you do. All right. I'm not saying everybody behaves the same. I will tell you that I engaged in no criminal activity, none whatsoever. Never have, never will. But what I did on the internet is not something that people should be proud of. It's uh, especially if you're married, I'll be the first one to say that, uh, but it wasn't criminal. 
And if anybody's going to hold to me account, it's going to be my wife, That's who, true. by the way, has forgiven me. We've been married 31 years. I have twin daughters. They they have no problem with it. My friends who are where they're they're all good. So all the people closest to me understand what happened, understand it wasn't criminal, and understand that I was at the lowest possible moment in my entire life. Yes, you um, were. And, and if again, like I said, I'm not going to get into the details because it's none of your business. That's it wasn't right. Criminal, so you have no right to know. Uh, but what happened is um, a prosecutor saw the name and said he can uh, he can he can make money with this. And uh, he he went off and he started a prosecution. You know, it's a computer crime. What uh, what they alleged me doing. But they wouldn't investigate. They wouldn't. They wouldn't look at my computer. Really? Oh no! See, I'm the hmm. one who said. Uh, I'm the one who said we can end this thing now. Why don't we take my computer and give it to the prosecutor and say, "Have at it, guys." There's nothing on there. There's no crime. Let's go. And they went. We don't want your computer. Well, I never I that, knew that important oh, there's detail. A lot you don't know. There's hmm. a lot you don't know. First hmm. of all, the incident in question was in an adults-only chat room. Yep an adults only chat room where the person that had to go in had to make a profile that uh, said they were over 18. And then on three occasions had to confirm that they were over 18 before they were allowed to interact. You're so, right. You know, so, so we have that, uh, you know, I don't want to get And if you're into- a cop, you can lie. That's legal. But I that's guess. what they say. But Pennsylvania, two, case law, Pennsylvania case law <laughs> says that, um, if two people meet, and they both agree at the start that they're over 18, anything that happens after that is ain't a crime. Right? That's okay, because the prosecutor is corrupt. Anyways, we, we tried to give him the computer, and um, hmm. my lawyer, first of all, said, no. <laughs> no way you're giving that computer to the prosecutor. I said, why not? He said, because they'll find something. I said, they won't hmm. find or anything. They'll plant right. something. Well, that's different, because, no, you take, you take a you scan. You, you, get, yeah. you do a scan of it, so if they planted something, it would be different from the scan, and no, it doesn't work that way. We're not right. stupid. Um, but we actually went out and hired uh, an NSA, a former NSA and a former FBI uh, cyber people and turned the computers over to them. And they did a top to bottom scrub of everything. And they came back and said, ain't nothing on here, boss. So we went to the prosecutor and said, here's the computer. Prosecutor said, I don't want to touch the computer. I don't want to have anything to do with the computer. And we're like, but you should, since this is a computer crime. Nope. So, so they just to, use their chat logs, basically? They, they just used the chat log of an adult chatting with an adult. Yeah. Right. Um, so we took the computer and we went to a, um, a retired um, special agent for the um, Secret Service who was one of the first people involved in um, the uh, computer crimes against children. Uh, he basically helped write the book for it. Uh, he has prosecuted over 25,000 cases, almost all of which were success- successfully put people away. And we came to him. Understand what I'm telling you. I'm going after the guy that prosecutes bad guys. I'm not going after the guy that defends bad guys. I'm going after the guy that prosecutes bad guys. And I said, I need you to look at this computer. And he said, no. And we said, why? And he said, because I will find something where there's smoke, there's fire. This is what I do for a living. People come to me and they say, do this and I will find it. And then you're screwed. You're going to jail forever. They said, don't let me look at this computer. And my lawyer got scared. And was like, I said, give them the computer. And I signed a waiver. I said, I, you're not a bad lawyer. I'm making this decision. Give them the computer. I have the letter. Someday I'm going to write the book and I'll publish the letter. The letter that the guy wrote to the judge for the first time in his entire career, he said, because he, he said, I have encourage people not to do this. I will find it. If there's something on there, I will find it. He said, for the first time in my career, I can write the letter I'm getting ready to write. There is no indication of a crime whatsoever. No indication of, uh, you know, a desire for underage uh, children. There's nothing here. You know, yeah, there's this adult adult stuff, but that's, that's his business. It's not none of my business. We're talking about a crime. There's no evidence of a crime. Not only that, he then went through the police report, and he said, this is an unprosecutable case. There's no crime that was committed. But not only that, the police officer violated everything, every, you know, every investigatory technique, et cetera, uh, you know, entrapment. I mean, the whole, you know, everything you could do wrong as a cop, he did yeah, wrong. He did. That's so right. So he said, 
you know, not only is there no indication of a crime, but the cop, so he was ready to testify. This is like the leading expert in America, ready to testify on my behalf. And the judge went, no, nope, inadmissible. We're not going to let him, we're not going to let him testify. And then they went and, um, you know, and, and they got some files unsealed on uh, incidents that occurred in 2001, which by the way, again, none of your business, but no crime was committed. The case was thrown out, dismissed, and the files were sealed. That means, first thing, that it's a legal nullity. There's no crime. It's a nullity. It's sealed for a reason because you don't, this stuff should never be in public, public life. But it's more than that. Another thing people may not understand, the the the, the cop uh, from that case who was so angry. Yeah, that let's thought, talk about that guy. Tom Breslin. Uh, well, we'll get to him in a second, but that, yeah. the cop <laughs> who, who leaked it, um, he, you know, he initiated something and the FBI was brought in. This is a fact that not too many people understand. The FBI came in under orders from the attorney general to get rid of they See, said, and happened. that's where we left off last time when we had you in for an they interview said, and we talked, you, know, you told the story about what? How the FBI had been messing with you at that point for well, they're, they're over a decade. Order. So the uh, the FBI came in and they broke the law. You know, they did they, what they did is they got a judge to unseal the files. Illegal as hell. Illegal as hell. Can't do it. And I'll tell you why it's illegal as hell because I later challenged that and I won. We took it up to the New York Supreme Court and they came back with a unanimous decision and said, you can't unseal the files. It's not allowed. But the FBI got a judge to do it. And then the files were turned over to the FBI, who worked with the prosecutors from the Northern District of New York, right here in Albany, New York. And normally when this has happens, you're dead. When the FBI gets files and they go to the Northern District, you're going to go to jail on these kind of charges. Wonder you had to be just so terrified. No crime was committed. No crime was committed. And we went to them and we said, we need you to write a letter that says that. And they said, we, we don't write that kind of letter. What we'll give you is a note that says that, um, you know, that, that uh, basically that you were a target and now you're no longer a target. Meaning, you know, it's so if uh, an employer comes up and asks, well, you had this, this incident, you could give them the letter and this kind of letter that they'd look and say, okay, this is a clean deal. But the point I'm trying to make is everybody who jumps on 2001 who thinks they know what they're talking about, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, no crime was committed. The files were sealed. Uh, anything you think you know from the files, and I'm sort of hampered here because um, hmm. I have an ongoing appeal. And part of the appeal is uh, appealing what happened in terms of the release of the files. I can say that what the public thinks they know is about that much of the record that this much of the record existed in all the stuff that the FBI reviewed and said, there is no crime here. Let's get out of here was never turned over to Pennsylvania. It all disappeared magically all the stuff. And I can't talk about the content of it because that's using something as a shield. And once you use it as a shield, then they're allowed to use it as a sword. We're saying they're not allowed to use the sword. So I can't go into the details of why there's, you know, that's just, a, if there's a sealed file, that information can never be public. That's right. Um, that's, that's that. Pennsylvania. Wasn't that where the Cosby case got overturned and he got kicked? He's well, you, free well, you don't know what, because again, of a what you don't, file. what you don't know is that my current, uh, my current appeal is, um, is based on the Cosby case. Bingo. Yeah. Yes. Cause so, it's the same you know, thing. They, the prosecutor used uh, evidence. The judge, uh, here file. we had a judge. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, so they they illegally got the file. They went back to a judge and illegally got 2001. And, and applying to it, what the prosecutor said is, we cannot successfully prosecute this case based upon what happened in Pennsylvania because there's nothing here. Right. We have to have 2001 so that we can manufacture a case. So you have to give us the file. If you don't give us the file, we cannot prosecute this guy. So what he's saying is, whatever happened in 2009 between consenting adults isn't a crime. But what they have to do is convince the jury that I really intended to be talking to a, a, an underage person. So they, they thought they were going to get something in 2001, but they cherry picked it to make a case up. But it was illegal what they did. 
-hmm. So we went to the judge and said, you can't, you can't do this. It's illegal. The uh, New York law, we cited it. Apparently in said, Pennsylvania, they do it anyway. All, as all the time. Well, what she said it. is, um, I will not reverse the decision of a New York court, um, no matter what the, the soundness of your league are. If you want New York, you know, she said, I will respect the decision of a New York court. If you want to change that, you have to go to the New York court and get them to change it. So we did. And we went to New York. We took it up the chain of command. And the highest court in New York said, illegal as hell. It should never have been unsealed. Boom. We came back to the judge and said, hey, hey. And she went, no, nah, we're going we're gonna to let it stay. Uh, I, I'm just telling you, the fix was in from day one. Um, so, I mean, if people have a problem with this. I mean, again, if, if you're going to tell me that you object to what I did in an adult's only chat room with another consenting adult, that's okay. I, I actually will say, I, I respect that. I understand that. Um, if you're perfect, if your name is Jesus Christ or you're the Virgin Mary, I, I get it. Um, otherwise, you're a hypocrite and, you know, God forbid somebody ever gets a hold of your Google search history. Um, Let you know, he among us who is without sin cast you know, that first stone. Yeah, and I, but again, if that's their position, I can at least respect that. If you want to take a moral principled stance based upon non-criminal activity and say, I condemn you for that. I'll be like, that's your business. No problem. But what they're trying to say, but and I mean, the term that you, you, they're calling it's me a lie. twice convicted pedophile. Yes. And that's a, I was convicted once, not twice. And but has not nothing to do with a pedophilia. pedophile. Yeah. I, mean, you, you, you know, I want to make possible. this so clear, Scott, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but I've been, <laughs> I've been answering people on social media now for a month who post, they get up in my replies on Twitter and they say, how can you back Scott Ritter when he's a twice convicted pedophile? And I'm like, hold up. You know, I want to make this so clear. Scott Ritter, to the best of my knowledge, never, ever interacted with an underage girl. In an adult well, underage person. He could have been interacted. I mean, I with, say, oh, you're, he interacted with a boy. No, he, he interacted I never with interacted an with an underage person <laughs> who was an adult. <laughs> I who was, the cop was, an, was adult. an adult who was an adult from the start. Yeah. And, and then, and then, I mean, again, I don't want to go into the details, but this adult, after engaging as an adult, injected a fantasy element. Mm -hmm. um, stupid, not criminal. Uh, you know, in, end of story. But, you end know, story. I don't care about, um, let, me, let me put it this way. You know who hates pedophiles more than any of your listeners? Mm, you. No, no, besides me. <laughs> who hates them? Who will kill them? Inmates. Right. Send a pedophile to jail. Watch what happens. True. They sent me to jail thinking... That was going to be the end of Scott Ritter. They set me up. They wanted me dead. They sure did, Scott. And I went to jail. The first thing that the, the corrections officers tell you is um, don't tell anybody about your case. Just keep your head down. Keep it low. And I'm like, my face was all over the damn television. Um, you don't tell anybody about my case. Inmates follow this stuff. They're addicted to crime stories. That's and, right. <laughs> and so when I showed up, they were literally lining up to kill me. Mm -hmm. Literally lining up to kill me. And so what I did is what you're not supposed to do. I took my paperwork to the head of the gangs. And I said, you guys want to kill me? Bam. I'm right here. Read it. Pass it around. Everybody should know you're, I'm not hiding from anything in this paperwork. Nothing. And at the end of that, if when that's done, you want to kill me? We'll go out back and I'll give you your bet. You can take your best shot. I'll take 50 of you down, but you'll probably get me in the end. But read that first. The Crips, the Bloods, the Latin Kings have a history of killing pedophiles. Yes, they do. They all came back and said, you got screwed. You got screwed. You're not a criminal. It's and obvious then, to anyone who really looks at it or has yeah. two brain cells to rub thing, together. Too, the corrections officers said the same thing. They're all saying, yeah. why are you here? Who did you piss off? Who did you anger? Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you another thing. To, to get parole, they sent me to five and a half years. Five and a half years was the, the sentence. Now, I could get out in 18 months. Um, at, at 18 months, the uh, judge and the uh, prosecutor put the kibosh on me getting parole. They are allowed to do that. The first time out, 
they're allowed to interfere and say, nope. And the reason why they said no is because I never pled guilty. See, they offered me a deal. They were going to put me in jail for 40 years. They offered me a deal. 40 years? Yeah, 40 Damn, years. that's a Jelaine Maxwell sentence right there. They said, they said 40 Ooh. years or you can cop a plea to this one charge and you'll just get parole, meaning no jail. All I had to do is plead guilty to one charge and I'd get no parole. I'd have to register as a sex offender. And I said, innocent men don't plead guilty to anything. My lawyer's going, this is the best deal possible, best deal possible. You got to take it. I said, no, we're going to trial. I will never plead guilty to anything I haven't done, but you could go to jail. Then I will go to jail, but I am never going to plead guilty. And we went to trial. And as I told you, all the evidence was suppressed. They introduced stuff they're not supposed to. I got convicted five and a half years. Now, it wasn't parole, really more about convicting you in the court of public opinion, Scott. All it was about. That was all it was about is, exactly. is to destroy my reputation. Now, yeah. to get paroled, and this is an important thing that people need to understand. You can't be paroled unless you plead guilty. You can't be paroled. I had a five and a half year sentence. Let me give you a quick headline of how this story ends. I was paroled after three years. Well, Scott, did you plead guilty? Nope. How did you get paroled? How did you pull that off? I pulled it off by being honest. So you have to go, as, as a sexual offender, you have to go through sexual offender treatment mm -hmm. because obviously you're you know mentally ill and all this kind of stuff. So I and I went to the head shrink and uh, to do the intake interview, and he's like, "Well, you got to sign this form." And this form says, "I am guilty of the charges." And I, I said, "I am not guilty of the charges." Uh, and uh, and he said, "Well, you'll you'll never be able to." I said, "Here, let me just make it clear to you. I took my file just like I did with the with the gangs, and I put it in front of him. I said, everything in that file is true. I'm not denying anything. Everything in that file is true." None of it's a crime. And he went, so you'll enter the program. And if I can convince you that what you did was a crime, or we can get a majority of the people in your group to disagree with you and say it's a crime, then you'll you know, reverse. And I said, well, we'll talk about that then, because I don't think it's going to happen. Um, and I said, but under that circumstance, I'll go in. So I went in there to a person. Everybody in the group went, you got screwed. And this guy said, you got screwed. You didn't commit a crime. And this is a guy who habitually fails people because they won't admit to their crime. He wrote a report that said he ain't guilty. They took it to the warden, and the warden went, I support his release. The parole people are freaking out. Again, when I write the book, I'll publish the reports. They're going, how can we parole him? He refuses to, to, to admit guilt. He continues to insist he's innocent. We can't parole him. We can't parole him. And the warden went, get him the hell out of my prison. And they did. They paroled me, even though I never pled guilty. Because I That's awesome. I didn't know that part of the story either. Yeah, That's I mean, there's just really so much cool. people don't know. But I mean, look, I'm not going to say that the this book. and the Latin King gave me a... Um, the, the, I'm not saying they gave me a free pass. Um, mm -hmm. I had to earn their respect, and you earn their respect by um, either fighting them or uh, playing basketball. And uh, I had to go on the basketball courts with these guys, and it was blood. It was literally, I mean, <laughs> elbows to the face, knees to the groin, push you on the ground, kick you, and then they see how you get up. And if you get up and punch them in the face, push them on the ground, then you're in. And so for three years, I played basketball with these guys, combat basketball, and uh, I won their respect. And I'll show you another part of the respect. Um, the prisoners came to me and they'd say, can you help me? And this is the sad thing about the American justice system. It's literally the prisons are full of, I'm not going to say innocent people, but people who never got justice. People who were brought in, uh, got railroaded by a public defender, that were unaware of their rights and ended up in prison. Um, and so I'd review their case. And I'm not a lawyer, but I will tell you this. I got two and a half years taken off a guy's sentence because he um, because they miscounted his uh, his thing. Uh, they miscounted the, the, the years. So I went in, redid the math, wrote it up. Boom. He got to go home for Christmas. And he was just in tears. I got another guy's case overthrown, new trial. I got another guy's case overthrown, but because he was guilty, instead of a new trial, he pled to a lesser charge, got to go home. Um, I mean... And so in the end, in prison, you're not allowed to share. It's a, it's a crime to share your paperwork because there's a whole predatory um, jailhouse lawyer thing where 
the, the old heads uh, take the paperwork and they pretend to be lawyers and they take money and, and then they send guys and, and they lose. The warden told the block administrator to tell the guards that prisoners were allowed to come to me for advice. No kidding. And they, I'm not kidding. And they literally wow. had a line. When, when it first came out, there was a line <laughs> of people waiting. And the head guard came in and he goes, what the hell is this? And they're like, no, 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 we're allowed to. And so what they did is you, they did a sign up. So they had a sign up. The, the prisoners would come in, sign up. And then when it was time, you know, all right, uh, 6481, 6481, go to Ritter, go to Ritter. And he'd come in and I'd have time and I'd review his paperwork. And then when we're done, he'd go in and they call the next guy in. That's how well respected I was in prison. So what I'm trying to say is anybody who thinks that labeling me a pedophile was going to cause me a problem in prison, you are about as wrong as you can get. Now, let me give you a pro tip, guys. Labeling me a pedophile in public, it ain't going to work because it ain't true. I'm not running from it. I'm not scared of it. There's nothing you can do to intimidate me. But what can do, and this is what I'm afraid of, to be honest, is that I keep telling people unwisely to say it to my face. <laughs> and I. I'm very concerned what will happen if somebody right. actually does that. because I don't <laughs> we don't want, want you go going back, back to prison. For, I don't you want know, to go back to prison for taking somebody's life because yeah. that's pretty much what would happen. So I have to tone it down a little, but it does infuriate me. I'll be the first. I'll be the most honest. It infuriates person in the world. me too. It infuriates me. It's frustrating because they're literally trying to destroy my life. Yes. But again, if you want to destroy me, that's man to man kind of stuff. But you're going after my wife. You're going after my children. Guys on the internet are using my children's names. Oh, God. I mean, um, and they're talking about my wife in the most vile ways. Oh. Um, you know, and so it, it, it does. And so people need to forgive me sometimes if I get angry, if I blew my temper, if I use bad language. Um, Honestly, you're you know, remarkably I'm, calm under the circumstances. Well, because, <laughs> because I've already... I didn't initially I didn't want to talk about it because I felt I that by talking about it, it would only give them ammunition. Right. But uh, since everybody else is talking about it and they're getting it wrong, right. I just felt like, what the hell? <laughs> talk about it. You know, you got a question. Ask me the question. I'm not going to run away from it. I'll be dead I'm so glad that you're opening up about this, Scott, because I know it's got to be hard. And I I just want to remind people that all throughout history. The intelligence agencies, certainly in the 20th century, and all throughout time in spycraft, have used sexual blackmail or sexual allegations to discredit their critics. And because we live in a puritanical society full of hypocrites. I mean, again, I'm not here to excuse any behavior. It's none of my business. Uh, what you know, what people do. Um, but I'll say this: when I look at Congress, the 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 congressmen who scream the loudest about homosexuality um, end up having wide stances in men's rooms. Exactly. In the airport, every time. Right. Every single every time. Every single and time. The people that scream about you know transsexuals, this and that, and the other thing, they end up having you know a closet full of transsexuals. Mm. And the people, and I'm just going to be frank with you. All you guys out there that are screaming about pedophilia, God help you if somebody ever goes through your search record. Okay, because I can tell you what, my Google search is clean. I mean, you know, especially now, it's very right. clean. Um, but, you know, I can guarantee you anybody who's out there going, he's a pedophile, freeze your computer, let me get into your computer, and let's see what we find, you hypocrite. Um, yeah, and if you, know, you don't think that the FBI <laughs> folks frames people on stuff like this, go to your favorite search engine and type in Operation Zorro. This was the operation that the FBI ran against Dr. Martin Luther King, Luther King. Yeah. in the 60s, where they bugged his hotel rooms, tried to catch him with a woman who wasn't his wife, tried to blackmail him. Even sent the man a letter, which was pen, penned by, I think, De, uh, Deloach, Hoover's second in command. The letter basically encouraged Dr. King to commit suicide. Commit suicide. Yeah. Yeah. Look, when I, I think I was such a horrible person, you know. When, yeah. When I, uh, when I resigned from the special commission, 
I think I told you this about the uh, meeting with the CIA guy. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and and he was my friend. I mean, I'll give Larry Sanchez is his name. Um, it's not covert anymore. You can say his name. It's a public official. But Larry Sanchez called me up and he said, um, you can't you can't leave because if you leave, the whole thing is going to come down. It's all about you. You've been the heart of this for many years. If you go, it's there's it, literally it will collapse. So we're going to put you on the phone with a senior official in the National Security Council. And they're going to ask you to stay. And I said, okay, I'll take that call. So I got on the phone, had the conversation. They begged me to stay. But in the end, they weren't willing to change what they were doing to interfere with my inspections. They pretty much wanted me to stay and just play the game. And I said, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so I turned it on. I was leaving with my, to turn to my resignation. And he, and he said, you know, shook my hand. He said, Scott, we've, we've been friends, but I, I'll never be able to talk to you again uh, because of this. And... Um, uh, what are we allowed to say on your air? Anything. Can I say the F word? Oh, yeah. Of course. I mean, I'm not going to do it gratuitously. Yeah. But what he said is. We're not uh, prudes he, here. <laughs> no, but I'm just, I, I think it's important to understand exactly what he said. He said, the moment you walk out this room, understand this. The FBI is going to fuck you in the ass. And they've told me that. And the FBI had been trying to fuck me in the ass. This was in 1998. Since 1996, the FBI had been trying to fuck me in the ass. They'd been following me, harassing my children, harassing my wife, harassing sure. everybody. From 19, all of 1997, Larry Sanchez told me, Scott, you need to be prepared to be swept off the streets. They have the arrest paperwork. The FBI is going to come in and take you off the streets, and I can't guarantee the outcome. What the CIA, because the FBI was accusing me of spying for That's Israel. Right. And so the CIA, what the CIA did do is get their senior legal counsel to write a letter to the FBI saying that everything I did was, you know, legally, uh, not only was legal, but had the permission of the CIA to do it, um, right. that I had cleared everything I was doing with the CIA prior to that. No laws were broken, et cetera. But the FBI was like, nope, we're going to get this guy because they wanted to shut me down. They wanted to shut me up. Yeah, that and you matters. know the playbook, what they're doing now, where they say you're a, you know, a, a, an agent of Putin, a Putin puppet, a Putin stooge, yeah. whatever. <laughs> Isn't that basically what they were trying to do with your wife in the 90s, saying that she was a Russian spy? Well, I mean, this is a funnier story. Um, it's funny, but it's not funny. I mean, it's sad. You know, my wife and I, we met in Vodkinsk, uh, which is the missile factory uh, that I worked at as a, as a weapons inspector. And everybody's going, oh, such a love story. No, she was an interpreter. I was doing my job. She actually thought that I was an evil spy. Um, and, um, of course you, know, did. <laughs> you know, so, so that's that. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't until after I got out of the Marine Corps and, um, and, and we, our paths crossed again. I mean, to be honest, I, I tracked her down because she's, she's a smart lady, a good looking girl. And I'm like, yeah, <laughs> you know. My wife left me after uh, after uh, that. She, she, my wife of five years, said, um, "You know, she can't be married to me because of the Marine Corps. Um, I've gone all the time. She was right. I was gone about 280 days a year. Yeah, you're married um, to the Marines. When yeah. you're and so Marines. she was like, you know, you have to choose between me or the Marine Corps. So I resigned from the Marine Corps uh, to you're save the marriage. Lost. And then we went to war. And because I went to war, she said, well, you made your choice and, and we got divorced. I, I, I don't blame her. I mean, she, she did what she did. Yeah. But when I left the Marine Corps, I was a free man. And uh, it was looking like I was going to be uh, working in the, in the Soviet Union for H.J. Hines, the tomato people, uh, building food processing plants. And the food processing plant they wanted me to build was in Piatigorsk in southern Russia. So I thought it would be a good idea to go to Georgia um, and see, get a lay of the land. And uh, who did I know in Georgia? Well, Marina, her family was in Georgia. So I would write them and try and get them to give me a, a visa to bypass the tourist visa to be invited. And it was a struggle. Uh, funny story. They finally, she finally said yes. But then I got, I got ordered to, to Saudi Arabia. Now, before I initiated contact with her, because I was an intelligence officer, even though I was read out of programs, um, I went to the special security officer and I said, I am in contact with the Soviet because I'm getting out. This is what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm planning on going there, et cetera. But I wrote it all up and I, and I put it on yeah. record and he yeah. wrote it. And he said, okay, so now 
I'm going to war. I read back into the programs. I'm down in Tampa Bay, Florida, and I'm getting ready to get on the C-141 to go off to war. Because I, I'm one of the only people, I had the highest clearances in the land. I mean, I knew everything. Just to be clear, you're talking about the first Gulf War, right? The first Gulf War. This is 1990, uh, 1991 at this point, uh, in January. Yeah. And so I become, they designate me a um, classified courier. They hand me a package of classified information, and I have to carry a, a sidearm. So I get a 45 pistol, you know, loaded, um, because if you try to take it from me, I kill you. Um, and so I'm going on the airplane, and on my way to the plane, walking across the tarmac, two cars come screaming up. Wham! You see, while I was waiting to deploy, I was trying to call Marina's family to tell them I couldn't make it. I was supposed to get out of the Marine Corps and go visit them in February. But now I'm going to war. So I'm trying to call them and say, I can't visit. I, I'm not going to be there for dinner. <laughs> right. And so I'm making the call, but I, I can't get through. I get to the to the operators. But, you know, trying to make a call from the United States to the Soviet Union, very difficult. And you get disconnected. So I never succeeded in getting through. These guys stop and they come out and they take my gun away. They take the classified information away and they read me my rights. And I'm like, hmm, what the hell's going on here? They pull me into a room and the guy goes, this is going to be very short. Um, why were you trying to call Moscow? I said, I wasn't trying to call Moscow. And they start going for the cuffs because they got me. I said, I said, I was calling Tbilisi trying to get a connection to Sukumi. They're like, they look at the record and they're like, yeah, he was calling Tbilisi. Why were you calling Tbilisi? Well, I was trying to get in touch with this girl whose family I was going to visit. And they're like, what? And I said, here's the deal. Reached to my wallet, pulled out. The, I said, that's my special security officer. Smart guy. I said, call him right now. There's a report on file that I wrote. It'll have her name and talk that my effort to call them and all that. And he'll confirm everything. They called him up and they came back and they went, this is the craziest story we ever heard. They said, here's the deal. Here's your gun. Here's the classified information. Get on that airplane and have a good war. Just don't try and call Russia from Saudi Arabia because nobody's going to understand. <laughs> and so I had I had to go to war on that. So right off the right. bat, you have this issue. Um, but we got married when I got out of the Marine Corps. And um, in 1994, um, while I was in the Marines, you know, we, we have kids, her family, her father, her, her parents were refugees. They got they were part of uh, the Civil War in Georgia. So they were ethnically cleansed. So we had them. So you have twins, you have the parents, and it's financially, it's, it's difficult um, to make ends meet. So while I was deployed into Iraq doing God's work, um, Marina calls up my father and says, um, I want to help Scott out. Here's a lot of stress on him about, you know, you know, earning enough money for the family. I want to get a, I want to get a job. And he doesn't, he didn't want me to get a job because he felt that, you know, he didn't want to put pressure, but I wanted my dad. That's how the trouble started. She wanted my to dad get a job. Said, yep. Why don't you call the FBI and see if they'll hire you as a linguist? And she said, will they do that? And he said, try. So she did. And she took the test and she passed the language test. But then what happened is because I was who I was and the CIA wasn't happy about what I was doing in Iraq, the CIA said, oh, no, 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 no. Scott's using her to get into the FBI to get secrets about the investigations that she can then give to Scott and then he can give them to who? The Russians? Mm. I don't know what they thought. Mm. But she became a, a target of investigation. And so they, you know, they they basically didn't hire her and they put her on what they call this congressional watch list of known foreign intelligence attempt to penetrate the US intelligence community. So my wife suddenly became this With known zero guy. evidence of that. None Just whatsoever. put her on a watch list. She's the mother of twins. I mean, great cover story. So, um, wow. so anyways, long story short, uh, 2001, and the FBI wants me to uh, help them out uh, going after um, uh, Naji Sabri, who's the Ira Iraqi foreign minister. There was rumors that he wanted to defect and that he had information about weapons of mass destruction. And I was meeting with Naji Sabri in the Iraqi mission trying to organize a, um, you know, a, a, a movie to make a movie. And um, so the FBI came to me and they said, um, hey, would you be willing to uh, just go in and, and, and just tell us what his mental, what, what he's thinking, you know, all that stuff. I said, sure, I'll do that. I mean, I'm an American. I don't want a war. I'd like to find out what the Iraqis are thinking. So I did that and uh, they came back and, and they're like, well, that was good. We, we, you know, how'd you like to come on and get on our Iraq team and, and help us, you know, 
figure out what's going on with weapons of mass destruction. I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And they said, well, first thing, first thing though, we have to solve the problem with your wife. I said, there's no problem with my wife. No, no, she's on the congressional watch list. Is that went, the first really? time you found out? First time I heard about that. Wow. And they said, well, she needs to take a polygraph. And I'm like, hmm, this sounds very strange. You guys want me to do something, but you have to polygraph my wife. And, I, and, and then they brought in other agents and said, oh, no, this is not normal, standard, routine, da, da, da. And I'm like, I did a polygraph. I, 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 I ran a polygraph program. It's not routine. I'm not, but they convinced me. So I went to Marina and I said, look, they'd like to polygraph you. Just They say it's no big deal. Get it over. And she's like, well, it's strange, but I've got nothing to hide. I'll, I'll, I'll do the polygraph. So she went in and she did the pre-polygraph interview with two very good-looking FBI girls who are just her friends, the best friends in the world. Don't worry, Marina will be there every step of the way. This is not a big deal. Da, 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 da. And then the day of the polygraph, Marina shows up. The girls aren't there. Instead, they have this asshole who um, brings her in, and he does. he conducts what's called a hostile polygraph, which means it's not about the polygraph. It's designed to intimidate you to confess. And he immediately throws a document down and starts screaming at her. You falsified government documents. You're a liar. I could arrest you right now. I could put you in jail. I could throw away the key. You're never going to walk away. And she's like, what lie? Mm -hmm. You said you didn't have any contact with foreign intelligence, but this person is a, you know, in the embassy, that's a KGB guy. Da, da, da. And she's like, I don't know that. You have to know that. I don't know. You said you're friends with his wife. I am. Then you know he's a spy. I don't know he's a spy. I mean, he might be a wow. spy, but I don't know that. And they're going on and on. And then they say that, I mean, and then it gets crude. It's basically, we're going to fuck your family. Her parents live with us. We have green cards. We're going to fuck your family. We're going to send them home. You're going to, we're going to fuck your brother. We're going to fuck your husband. We're going to fuck everybody unless you confess to your crime right now. That's and what they to do. To her credit, she stood up, she put her hands out and she said, cuff me. Cuff me right now. And when they did, and she said, that's because you've got nothing and I'm done. And she left and they're screaming at her. I mean, this would make a great movie scene. They're Your wife is a hell of a courageous perfect, lady. Perfect face. We're going to fuck you. You're going to get, a, you'll never get off the list. You'll never get off the list. And she leaves the FBI headquarters and they've been going after us ever since. I mean, yep. I, I mean, I could just bend your ear all night about the things they've done. To the present that's what the day, FBI does right? for a living. Yeah. To, and here we are very again. Day. And, you know, most of the slanders online against you, certainly on Twitter, come from NAFO fellas. Oh, yeah. We need to explain to our listeners who and what NAFO is, who created NAFO, and what NAFO does. Well, NAFO stands for North Atlantic Fellas Organization. It's not a serious organization. Um they basically are trolls. They they admit that their number one tactic is shit posting. Mm -hmm. Their job isn't to be factual or anything. What they you've probably they've seen become, them. You know, when you're on Twitter, they're always the ones who have the avatar image the of Shibu the, Inus, yeah, yeah. Shiba yeah. Inus or whatever the dog, yeah, the little doggy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and there's a, a former Marine who came out and he saw. Uh, the, long story short, is they they create this organization, and if you register with them, then they they issue you a Shibu Inu, Inu meme, and then you can put that on your thing. You're now a fella. But the whole thing about them is if they see something that they deem to be pro-Russian, then they basically it. put out the call and they swarm it. And the idea is to just basically swarm you, shitpost you, and get you to back down, get you to quit, get you to do whatever. Oh, they and then the other thing they do is they- several times. They mastered the, uh, the the Twitter algorithm. So by filing complaints against you, they could trigger the algorithm to get you kicked off of Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, so and they very use that draconian German law to do it. They file the yep. complaints with Twitter saying, you're violating German law. German laws. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 get, road. I, know you I get five or six uh, uh, notifications from a Twitter day. a day yep, that, I'm, uh, that I'm in violation of German law. Me um, too. Fortunately, but, you know, Twitter that, ignores that's what the, them, but that's what the you've fellas been banned do. off Twitter more times than I can count, Scott. Yeah. The, 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 the thing about NAFO is they um they pick a theme. So their theme right now 
is to take um, my uh, sex offender registration page, mm -hmm. um, which, again, I just want to tell people, Pennsylvania made me a level three a sexually violent cr a predator, the highest level possible. Uh, they just, again, manufactured the case. So when I was paroled, I came to New York. And um, the thing about it is every state is responsible for assigning their own um, level. And generally speaking, it's automatic. And so whatever Pennsylvania said came over in New York, but there was a hearing. And at first I was just like, I, I just, I don't want to do this hearing. I'm just, but then I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm going to fight this thing. So I went to the hearing. I represented myself. I wrote a, um, what they call a motion in limine uh, to, to, because I said, the only way they can make me a sexually violent predator is if they allow the unsealed files to become in and interpreted in an incorrect fashion. Um, and I had a New York Supreme Court case unanimous that said that that was illegal. So I fought it. I went, represented myself, and wow. um, I beat them. The prosecutor here, um, uh, uh, she knows who she is. Uh, she she was pulling out all the stops to get me a level three assignment. Um, at the end of the day, the judge cited on my, and what the judge basically said is the entire case is is flawed. Um, Which it, it was. There's no case here. But because New York can't overturn a Pennsylvania conviction, the right. conviction stands, but it's going to be a level one, the lowest level, low level offender, you know, no risk to society. And she so for me coming. to understand what you say all these years later, you're still appealing, but you're appealing in the state of Pennsylvania, correct? I'm still in the state of, yeah, in Pennsylvania. Yep. No, I just got my. Um, oh, looky this there. Is my, this, is, this is my initial response from the, uh, the Superior Court, and they have remanded because I challenged the lower court's decision. They've remanded it back to lower court saying that I, I have a case. So all you haters out there. I'm not going to wait. Say, but you know what I want to say. <laughs> wait. wait. Watch this space. Uh -huh. but the, you know, Scott's going to get the last point. laugh. Be careful, folks. Well, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, look, don't count your chickens before you have. That's true. Um, That's true. Can't Pennsylvania is the justice system will do. And it's, there's, there's no guaranteed outcome except this. I will never stop fighting. Right. I will never accept the conviction. I will always fight the conviction because that's what innocent people do. Exactly. I think have we've you, Have you told this on. story before? You got a lot of first time information. Tonight, I think we guys. got ourselves a scoop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But there's, trust Thanks. me, I'm sitting, I'm sitting on a couple boxes worth of stuff that if uh, at some point in time when the appeal's over, if I want to, I, I mean, I have a lot of people saying you have to write this story because it is such a gross misrepresentation of justice. I mean, what, what happened to me? But it's not it's not what unique. a painful it's book to have to write. And well, I, it I, is. I know yeah. if you have the support of your wife and your family to tell this story, I hope to God you do. Well, she wants me to tell it. Yeah, she wants me to tell it more than I want to tell it. I would think um, so. But, you know, she um, she's very supportive. Um, look, I, I, let's put it this way. Uh, when 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 this first came down. She was very, very angry at me, getting ready to tell me to pack my bags and leave the house. Who could but, blame her? Uh, when, they, when they published the transcript of the interaction, she took it, she went upstairs, and she locked herself in the room. And um, I can guarantee you that if anything on that transcript had implied um, that I was going after underage girls, she would have come out. She would have left said, your ass. Kick, well, she would have kicked me out. She <laughs> That's left right. Me, kicked me out of the house. <laughs> And she came out, and to her credit, she said, um, I'm not happy. I'm not happy about any of this. I want you to know that. I am not happy. But she said, there's no crime here, and we're going to fight this thing. And um, and she stood by me the whole time. You know. Now, that's and a Valentine's was, Day love story, folks. Well, she, she, she's the best wife in the world. She stood by me uh, through, through the hardest times, um, and she never lost faith. Um, you know, and they tried their best to destroy her. I, and people have to understand this. When you send the breadwinner to prison, right. you destroy the family. And that's their whole tactic because they want to break you. And one of the best ways to break a prisoner is to have the wife break leave the them, to deny them access to their children. To And then they break in prison. Prison's yes. not about rehabilitation. It's about destroying human life, plain and simple. And while I wouldn't plead... I wouldn't plead uh, guilty to something I didn't do. She wouldn't let them beat. And 
I don't need to go into what she did, but she, she ended up working to save our family. She worked four jobs. Um, Cause they're trying I, to break you financially too. Well, they almost did. Oh, <laughs> I know. Almost, I mean, we're, no. we are just now, I mean, it's been, I don't know how long since I got released. We are just that we still haven't turned the debt corner, but we're just now getting to the point where we're like, we might be able to turn that debt corner and get out of the, because we had to go bankrupt. And anybody who hasn't gone through bankruptcy doesn't understand what that does to you. You can't get credit cards. You can't, uh, you can't do anything. And when you're denied employment opportunities, uh, because who's going to hire a twice convicted pedophile? Uh, you know, so you're denied. They won't even let you speak at an anti-war rally. They won't even let me speak at an anti-war rally, but yeah. you know, I'm not getting paid to do that. But, um, no. Yeah, but I mean, that's that's the long story short. So anybody who wants to know why I'm not speaking at the anti, it's because of that story. That's the back story. Yeah. But let me tell you why I should be speaking it. And I'll do this very shortly. Hell yeah. Uh, tell short. them why. Um, in Iraq, I was a weapons inspector and I did it for seven years. I was uniquely positioned to know the truth about Iraq's weapons of mass destruction program. I wasn't pro Saddam. I was pro truth. Um, you know, all the people that call me a Putin shill today, a Russian propagandist. Hey dudes, man, this isn't my first rodeo. I used to be called a shill for Saddam. I used to be called an Iraqi propagandist. Why? Yeah. Because I told the truth. I told the truth about weapons of mass destruction. People didn't want to hear the truth. Um, in addition to speaking out and, and putting fact-based information, I made a decision that because I was uniquely positioned with information, when I say uniquely, let me tell you how many people had the same knowledge I had. None. So when I say unique, I was unique. I was the only person who could do what, what I could do. The only person. There was no one else that could do it. And that's a big burden to put on your, that's on your shoulders. When you realize, I know the truth, but the smart thing would be to walk away. Say nothing. The smart thing mm -hmm. would put your head down, walk away, and get the job. Right. Grab the golden key. I was offered the golden key. Paul Wolfowitz offered me the golden key. Paul Wolfowitz sat me down and... Washington DC national airport and laid out the, 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 I think it was at that time, I call it the $6 million plan, but I, I'm going to say it was more like a three and a half million dollar plan. But basically all I had to do is play the game and I would get money. I would get prestige and I would get an entree into the club. Um, and I'm looking at it going, okay, but what do you want me to do? Lie. I need you to lie. And I said, I can't do that. Uh, and so I was now out of the club, not making any money, but instead of quitting, I made things worse. I made a documentary film that nobody wanted me to make that the FBI attacked me viciously for that. Uh, you can go on my uh, website, scottritterextra.com. It's called In Shifting Sands. It's free. You can watch it. Yeah, and if you great. watch it, I, I, I can guarantee you no one's going to watch that and say lies. You're going to watch that and go, holy cow, that's all. That was all true. I made that movie in 2001. Understand that. The idea of making that movie was to get people to be exposed to the truth. But instead, the FBI attacked me. Shut yeah, it down. What do you know? The timing of your first conviction just kind of coincided with that. Well, it wasn't convicted. Not, not a conviction. The first, not a conviction. The first, right. the first and they started messing with you. Well, that's exactly what they wanted to do. They tried to destroy my life. And they almost succeeded. But timing, even after though, that. Timing. Even after that, I said, you know, now what can I do? And, uh, you know, George Bush met with uh, Tony Blair in September of uh, 2002 in Crawford, Texas, and they were hatching up a scheme to go to war. And their whole thing was because there's no weapons inspectors in Iraq, we have to assume that Iraq is doing the worst things possible. And I went, holy cow, that's an argument that will resonate because people will be afraid of that which they don't know. I said, but how do you get inspectors back in, especially after the history of my history where my teams were used to spy on Iraq and assassinate Saddam and all this kind of stuff. How would the Iraqis ever let them back in? Who could make that case? The guy they trust, the father of all crises, Scott Ritter. They trust me because I never lied to them. They trust me because I was a mean son of a bitch. They trusted me because I, I stood my ground and, and fought for the rights of inspectors and that I did the job with integrity and honesty. So I traveled to South Africa. Tarek Aziz was going to South Africa to get a uh, bypass surgery. Um, so I traveled to South Africa and I met Tarek Aziz, who's the deputy prime minister. 
And I said, you got to let me into Iraq. Now, I'm doing this as a private citizen, ladies and gentlemen. People keep saying, what can I do as one person? What can one person do? Listen to what one person did here. We're going to go to war against Iraq because we're saying there's no weapons inspectors, and therefore we have to assume the worst. So one person flies, meets with the deputy minister, and says, I have to be allowed to speak to your parliament. And he said, you're never going to do that. No, no foreigners ever address the Iraqi parliament. He said, why do you want to speak to the parliament? I said, because I want to make the case for weapons inspectors to be allowed back in. He said, they'll never be allowed back in. They're all spies. I said, you don't understand. If you don't let them back in, you're all going to die. And I made the case. Tarek Aziz got me into Iraq. I spoke before parliament. Never happened before, ladies and gentlemen, a very unique thing. They didn't screen my speech. I insisted that it be broadcast live with all the media there so nobody could walk away and say anything. After that speech, I was able to speak with the leadership of the Iraqi government to the highest levels. And uh, when I came back to the United States, after I told the Iraqi government they have to let inspectors back in, they said, we'll think about it. I came back to the United States. I was attacked viciously. I mean, I was called a shill for Saddam. I was called an Iraqi propagandist. I was I mean, everything bad. I was getting ready to go on CNN's crossfire where the producer said they're going to crucify you. They're going to hammer you as a, you know, an apologist for Saddam. Um, five minutes before airtime, a news story came out. Iraq just agreed to allow weapons inspectors back in. Why? It wasn't me. One man. One man got weapons inspectors back in. And that should have been enough to stop the war. It wasn't. But um, when people say, you know, oh, he's not anti-war enough. Really? How many of you have done what I did? How many of you have done that? How many of you have put it all on the line? How many of you have put everything on the line? One person going out there as far out as you can get. I got extended beyond what you could understand. And uh, I did everything and I succeeded. I did what I set out to do, get weapons inspectors back into Iraq. It's just that the U.S. government was never going to allow the truth to be told. But uh, I at least gave the truth a hearing. And um, so all these people out there right now with their little, you know, he's not anti-war enough. I'll put my anti-war resume up against yours any day of the week. And there's not a single person out there, not a single person out there that has done what I have done to try and stop a war. So when we come here today and uh, I want to talk about Russia, I want to talk about this conflict. I want to talk about Russophobia. I want to talk about how we have misconstrued Russia and Vladimir Putin. Um, and everybody's going, well, you're a Russian propagandist. I'm like, no, see, you called me a Saddam propagandist before. It didn't work. I am simply in favor of the truth the fact-based truth. Let's talk about the truth. And then from that, under you know, once we get the truth down, it sort of becomes obvious what we should be doing. And we shouldn't be supporting a Nazi regime in Ukraine. But um, anyways, that's where we're at. Uh, they don't want me to speak at the uh, rally because they're afraid of what I'm going to say. Uh, they don't want me to speak at the rally because um, it's not about anti-war. It's about uh, empowering a certain political party, the Libertarian Party. Um, they want to use the anti-war rally as a way of legitimizing themselves, mainstreaming themselves, but they want to make sure that only they get the credit. Um, so they don't want someone like me to come in and speak and throw out ideas that they're not in control of. Uh, Nick Brana wanted me to give a speech about my book, about my mission to Russia, about trying to uh, build bridges uh, to break down the walls of Russophobia, to put arms control back on the agenda to make sure that the world doesn't end in a nuclear holocaust. Um, and God bless Nick Brana. And uh, his, his counterpart in the Libertarian Party, she wanted it as well, but her party wouldn't support it. So they insisted that I be pulled from the, uh, from, from the venue after they, first they invited me, then they disinvited me, but then all the speakers said, if Ritter doesn't speak, we won't speak. So they put me back on, but then they disinvited me again because the attacks, you know, twice convicted pedophile, kept me allowed to speak. Um, and I could have fought them. I actually was going to fight them. I was so mad. Um, people look up New York defamation laws. There's five things you have to prove. Um, all of them were proved except the fifth one, which is damage. Um, you, you, you can't just assume damage. There has to be demonstrable damage. And if they kicked me off this platform, then we have demonstrable damage. And I owned the Libertarian Party. And I keep trying to tell them that. Guys, I owned you. You're really stupid. What you did was stupid. But I agree, I was, Scott. And, I have to tell you, I've been a libertarian for 27 years, and I broke with my party. I left the libertarian party because of how they treated you. Yeah. And 
I honestly wish you would sue them for slander. And I hate to say well, it, the problem is I'm if I did that long time libertarian, but they did yeah. in fact slander you. Oh, they oh, libel, I think. Is, is libel. The, yeah. The, okay. um, but the thing is, here's the thing. And I was going to do it. I was going to do it. You want to go to war? Let's go to war. Um, but then, you know, and I'm not going to give their names away, but these are well-known people who are speaking and they came up and, and Nick came up too. Nick, Nick said, they Scott, up for you. you have every right to do what you're doing, every right to do it. And we wouldn't condemn you if you did, but one, if you do this, there won't be a rally. The Libertarian Party will pull the permits and they will shut this thing down. There won't be a rally. And all the people we've worked to come and speak at this event won't get a chance to speak, and we may never get them back together again. Right. And then the other thing they said is, even though you're right, this will become about you. And people will say that you're petty, that you're that you put your personal interests above that of the collective. And I'm well, I'm like, yeah, I mean, I've been attacked for so long. Maybe it's time I did that. Um, and I have the perfect opportunity now. I have a legitimate legal case that can go out there and challenge people who like to label me pedophile. What a um, choice to have to make, though. But I made the well. No, it's a, it was a tough one because here you are with the winning, you know, the winning hand. And um, but I went okay. I mean, stopping a nuclear war is more important. It's more important than winning a legal case. So I um, I backed off and I said, and "There's still a statute of limitations. You can sue later." No, there has to be damage. There has to be damage. I, and if, there does by, have to be by, damage by me making decision to back off voluntarily. I eliminate the damage clause and the, the, the lawsuit goes out the window. But that's okay. I, you know that's what? Okay. To be honest, the last thing I need right now for my poor little heart is another uh, another court another case. Legal, yeah, another court case. So, um, you know, I got one going right now for my reputation and my future. Um, you know, to, where do to I go, go to get my reputation back? Right? Isn't that the old? Yeah, but you know, the other way you get yeah. reputation back is just to be you, be honest about it. Um, that's right. You know, like I said, you. Know, if you guys think that Scott Ritter is the perfect human being, you got another thing coming. There ain't no nothing perfect about me. I'm not a bad guy. I'm a good friend. I'm a great father. I'm a great husband. But I'm as human as the next person. I'm not, you know, literally, um, no. <laughs> so I was a Marine, people. I was a Marine. Okay, understand what that means. Um, we're we're a lot we of testosterone. I hear in the Marine. We all look good in our uniforms. <laughs> But um, you know, we are very energetic people, and um, and and Marines are known for hard drinking and whatever else they do. Um, I'm not proud of it. I'm not bragging about. It. I'm not saying it's good, but I'm not. I'm is. not trying it to do something I wasn't. Um, but I will say this too: at my trial, um, I had easily oh, twenty letters from um, women who I had interacted with professionally uh, in the anti-war thing, all writing to the judge saying, I have never met a more professional person, a gentleman. He, there was never any untoward activity. He never did that. So is, even though I'm saying that I was human, I never, ever, ever, ever mistreated a woman. Never once in my life have I mistreated a woman. Never once have I assaulted a woman, sexually harassed a woman, anything like that. Um, did, I, did I drink to excess? Yeah. Did I get in fights? probably some I shouldn't have gotten into, um, you know, things like that. But under, you know, everybody's like, well, you know, that Scott must have a sexual history. Not as much as you think it might be, guys. Um, I was actually a gentleman. I was raised to be a gentleman. I was raised to treat women right. And the record is clear that that's, that's the case. Again, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm not a bad person. Um, and if all these people want to label me as something, it ain't going to stick. <laughs> so nice try. You know, I want to uh, share with people, I'm going to bring up uh, your blog. You wrote about this, and I'd like to direct our listeners to read this blog by Scott Ritter. Can you guys see that? There. There you go. Go to scottritterextra.com. And Scott, I mean, what he told us today is probably even better than the blog because he went into much more detail. But here's the blog. Get out of my damn backpack. <laughs> <laughs> That's from uh, uh, the the movie. Uh, it was a George Clooney movie, um, uh, Up in the Air, uh, where he is yeah. the guy who goes around and fires people and, and you know and all that. But he gives a great speech in there. His character gives a speech about uh, a backpack and um, 
how if you're going to go on a journey, uh, what's in your backpack and what you end up putting in your backpack. And, you know, I want to go on this journey. I want to go on a journey that will break down the walls of Russophobia and hopefully end up with a million person uh, march in, uh, in Central Park that puts, puts arms control back on the political agenda. I think people need to understand what I'm saying here. In June of 2024, I want to do my best to get a voting block that tells the politicians that are running for election for national office in November 2024 that arms control is on the table, just like any other issue is, and that if they don't support arms control, if they don't articulate in favor of arms control, they won't get the vote of this massive block. I want to empower arms control, not as a libertarian, not as a Republican, not as a Democrat. So that's my journey. I have this backpack, and um, I need to make sure that that backpack isn't full of, you know, nonsense. So what I say in the blog is you can either be walking with me on this journey, and I welcome it because nobody should go on a journey alone, but I'm not going to carry in my backpack. And it was a message to the Libertarian Party. You know, you guys aren't going to get a free ride. I'm not going to do all the work for you. You don't get to attack me and then jump in the backpack and accompany me on this journey. You guys have opted out. Get the hell out of my backpack. (laughs) And you know, while I'm on your blog, I also want to plug the speech that unfortunately you won't get to give Sunday at the rally. Um, It's called The Best Speech I Never Gave. And you have published it for the world to read on your blog at Scott Ritter Extra. And And a lot of people ask me to, um, to record it. And so yeah, I was um, going to ask you to read it today, but I think you have well, other plans. Well, what we did is um, Jeff Norman, again, a good friend of mine. Um, we actually, I, 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 I gave this, gave the speech, and he recorded it, and he's doing some uh, editing. Oh, nice. And um, we're going to the uh, the anti-war rally begins at twelve thirty on Sunday. At twelve noon, we're going to broadcast this. Uh, we're going to stream this uh, this speech. Oh, cool. So we're going to kick off this rally with the speech right. they didn't want me to give. So I guess I'm going to have to change the title. Are you also going to be speaking at another event concurrent to the rally? Not concurrent. Um, the, the rally, whether I physically attend the rally, I mean, I'm going to be in Washington, D.C. Um, there, you know, I'll, I'll do that. Um, Still time to I, change I, your mind, libertarians. Invite him back. I don't know. Because here's the thing. Um, there's so much rancor. There's so much, I mean, people have, I've received death threats by the dozen. Um, and so there, you know, I'm not a coward, but I am a little concerned. Uh, you know, do I go there and what happens if a guy takes a swing at me? Do I really want to spend Sunday night in jail waiting for a Monday morning court appearance that won't happen until Tuesday because Monday is President's Day? And no, I don't want to do any of that. Way to ruin so, a weekend. Yeah. So I don't know, but I am, um, there's a, there's a great, uh, a great guy named, um, uh, Caleb uh, Malpin. I may be mispronouncing. Caleb, that's our Caleb. friend Caleb. He's been on the show. Just yeah, had him on, uh, good guy. Uh, and he, good guy. he he heads he up invited the you, didn't he, to the CPI event after the rally? I hope you'll come. And, and I am going to the CPI event uh, because they are quality people. They are, and um, and they have what, what's interesting is they have a, a group. There's a a guy I did his uh brought uh, done his podcast. Uh, He's just a college kid, uh, Bradley uh, Wasser, I think his name is. Um, and I, I've done his po- and um, he asks great questions, and his podcast gets a lot of attention uh, whenever I go on it, which is I'm glad for him. But he represents a demographic of college kids who are politically motivated and they want to do the right thing. And um, man, I couldn't think of better allies. So I'm going to go there and try and build bridges, try and build alliances, and see if uh, you know. Caleb and uh, and Bradley and all the CPI people want to join me on this journey, uh, and we can end up in Central Park with a million people. And let me tell you, my book just got picked up in Russia. Oh, it's getting awesome. public now. I'm, I'm breaking news right here. It's getting public in Russia, and I'm going on a book tour in Russia, and I'm bringing a documentary film crew. And then we're going to make a documentary film that I'm going to then take around the country and as a trailer to attract attention amongst groups in the country. And on in June of 2024, we're going to premiere it live in Central Park 
is part of this demonstration. Oh, and it that. will be premiered live in Russian at the same time in Moscow, where hopefully oh. there's a million Russians in the street in solidarity with Americans saying, we don't want war. You know what we that kind of reminds me of? I, I don't know if this influenced you in any way, but you've probably seen that wonderful documentary from 1978 called The Unknown War. It was made by I Bert haven't. Lancaster. You remember that? Did I just steal somebody's idea? Did I just? Well, no, you didn't steal it. But it was unprecedented during the Cold War that an American film crew was allowed to come to Russia to make a 20 part documentary series about not just World War II, but specifically the war between Germany and the Soviet Union. Oh, no, no, I'm familiar with that. I'm I'm familiar with that. You're familiar with that, right? It was a big deal at the time. And we had unprecedented cooperation in the making of that film from the Russians. Uh, They were allowed access to the Soviet film archives. And it's honestly, I've been binge watching it for the, like the last four weekends. It's so good. It's free. We're not going to make a 20 part series. We're just going to make one one feature length documentary, but the goal is to premiere it um, on that date. That'll be the world premiere as part of this uh, thing where, you know, I, I've got to get some allies. I got to get some people that understand how to do this kind of stuff. We, we have some ideas. Uh, you know, there's this guy named Roger Waters. It's a pretty big deal. And he has a wonderful song Roger. called two sons in the sunset. Mm-hmm. And uh, wouldn't it be awesome if Roger Waters uh, played a set that finished with that song to remind everybody what's at stake here. Um, there's just some things that can happen here that can make this again. It's not a demonstration against something. It's a demonstration in support of arms control. That's it. We're not trying to dictate an outcome because that's the business of nations. We're not here to tell America and Russia how to do their business. What we are saying is you have a job to do. Get to work. I'm not telling you how to do it, but get to work. Stop this nonsense where we're not talking with each other. Stop this nonsense where the only remaining arms control treaty expires in January or February of 2026. And when it's gone, ladies and gentlemen, we're gone because it's off to the races with an arms race that cannot be controlled, especially given the fact that we can't talk to one another. The big problem right now in America is Russophobia. We are so inundated with nonsense about Russia. I'm not telling you to love Vladimir Putin, but I would like you to at least know who he is before you condemn him. Um, and, and at least and be good we, to the Russian people. None of this is their fault. No. Well, in the Russian people, they, and, th- and this is the purpose of the movie, because I want to go over there. And I talk about this in my book, um, how when I went over there as a weapons inspector, I literally just spent two and a half years trying to kill, Ru- learning how to kill Russians. That's all I wanted to do. Literally. I was a Marine. That's I lived, breathed, dreamed about how I can take the art of war and kill Russians. But then That's we told a story to about how your perspective changed. I forget what year it was, but no, 1988. Uh, yeah, it was a Russian family that invited you over for New Year's dinner. Igor right? Yefremov. He was a he was a missile designer. Built the missiles to take out America. So he spent his life learning how to kill Americans, mm-hmm. and um, he invited me and three other Americans to his home on New Year's Eve, and um, it was one of the most intimate experiences of my life. And what I mean by that is Russians have very small homes. They're not like the United States where small homes. So when you come into that home, there are no secrets. It is there. The family is there. Everything about the family is there. Um, And he let us in. And we realized that this man is just like us. He loves his wife. He loves his children. He loves his neighbors. He invited his neighbors in. They tell jokes. Some of the jokes are good. Some of the jokes are bad. Um, You know, they cry, they laugh, they can get angry. They, they're just, they're human beings. And then they took us down to the street and they have the giant Christmas tree in the, in the center of town and the entire city gathered around and uh, we're singing songs and greeting people. And you're sitting there going, this is communism. This is paradise. And I don't mean that naively. I'm just saying, wow, humanity. And I stopped hating Russians that night. I fell in love with Russia, not the blind, naive love, but I realized these are fellow human beings. And what we're doing with this treaty is a good thing because I wasn't all on board with this treaty up until that point. I was doing my job, 
but I was more about playing the spy versus spy game. Yeah. Um, at that point in time, I said, no, this treaty has to work. This treaty is what it's all about. This treaty is how we end. This is how we end war. a cold war, how we begin something new. Yes. And the treaty did its job. Understand that we failed going on. We, we, we didn't follow through, but that's not the treaty's fault. And I believe that the, the United States and Russia, we deserve a second chance. And that's why I wrote this book, because this book isn't just about the history of the INF Treaty. It's a template of hope because things were really bad in the 1980s. Yeah. And yet this treaty got us past that. Things are really bad today, but a new arms control agreement can get us past that. And maybe this time we won't drop the baton. Maybe this time we'll finish the race. And it's a good race to be in, ladies and gentlemen. It's the best race to be because it's the race of survival of humanity. And so that's the Arguably journey. Arguably the only race that counts, huh? It's the only race that counts. Everybody else. Look, I'm not trying to trivialize any anybody's beliefs. I know that in the United States and Canada and everywhere else, people have strongly held beliefs. And some of them are, you know, directly in opposition to other people's strongly held beliefs. I know there's people out there who believe the Second Amendment should be interpreted one way and the other people believe it should be interpreted another way and that gun control is a big issue. I know that, um, you know, uh, the right to life, abortion is a big issue. And I'm not here to line up with anything. But what I'm trying to tell you is, regardless of your position on gun control, regardless of your position on abortion, none of it matters because we're all going to die if we don't get arms control back on the agenda. And so I need, I need everybody. I don't care if you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, you're a progressive. I don't even care if you're a libertarian. Um, I, I Please don't know forgive me, Scott. Not you. I have no problem with, with the you. Party. I just, you know, there's a party that I have problems. Leave all your ideological baggage at home and agree on one thing, that the human race has to come together to bring arms control back on the table. And we can do that if we unite as Americans. And we can do that with the help of not just, because I have to tell you, I, I did a, a podcast uh, with Bulgarians the other day. And when I brought this up, he's like, we can demonstrate in Sofia. I said, yeah, you're going to demonstrate in Sofia. Yeah. And we're going to get them to demonstrate in Paris. We're going to get them to demonstrate. It's going to be a damn worldwide. I want the whole world in the streets on that day, at that moment, sending a sign that we are in solidarity with the American people who are trying to save the world. And Give then, us the date again. What's the date again? We don't know the date. We have to. I have to go pull out. The, it's going to be in June of 2024. Like I said, I got to figure out how you go in Make and you get the 22nd. Make it the anniversary of Operation Barbarossa. There, well, there you go. <laughs> the Unknown War, it premiered on June 22nd, 1978 for a reason. Well, there we go. Maybe uh, I'll have to see if June 22nd is a, uh, a weekend. But yeah. anyways, the bottom line is I'm going to find some people that know how to do, uh, like Roger Waters knows how to put on a big concert. So he has people that know how you go to Central Park and how you book that, how you get the permits, how you do this. There's other people that know how to do this. I can't do this by myself. I've got, I've got to have help. I've got to have people that say, we're here, we're, we're part of a team. Um, and once we get that team together, we can make this happen. This can really happen. And I'm I telling you help. right now. Put me to work, bro. I want to help. Well, everybody I'm can in. help. I mean, look, the best way to, the, the best thing anybody can do is just show up. Mm. Just show up. I mean, I you know, at, at the end of the day, just show up. And why not? It's to save, if you're a grandma, it's to save your grandchildren. If you're a parent, it's to save your child and your grandchildren. This is about the future of the world, the future of humanity. Um, and we got to find a way, you know, to, to, to get past the stupidity of labeling people, of trying to destroy people, to discredit people, and instead focus on the future and how to get beyond where we are so that we have a shot at life. I mean, life is hard. It's a struggle. There's nothing guaranteed. There's, it's going to be hard no matter what. But at least give people a chance to experience life in all of its wonder, all of its terror, all of its horror. Give the next generation a chance to experience what we experience, a chance, a hope to do better than we do. But we can't. they can't do better if we destroy the world. 
and we're going to destroy the world. Nuclear weapons will be used. Look at the scare that's going on right now. Everybody's talking about the potential of nuclear conflict. Imagine for a moment that we eliminate arms control so nobody's talking, and now they're building all these weapons that are going to be put in the field with the tensions the way they are right now, with the total distrust, where we think the Russians are out to get us, and they think we're out to get them. So the first mistake, one mistake, and it's all over. And it's not like the Cold War where you had 30 to 40 minutes to decide whether or not it was a mistake. The new weapons with hypersonic warheads, they're going to be hitting targets five minutes after launch, which means that the second something's detected as being launched, they're going to come in with a complete retaliation. And even if they go, oops, mistake, it's too late, guys. It's all over. And it's going to end. People make mistakes. And so the only way to stop this outcome is arms control. Arms control is the only solution. It's the only thing people should be focused on right now because nothing else matters. And don't tell me I hear people, that's a job for the Arms Control Association, the professionals. They got us where they're at, where we're at right We've now. been waiting for them to do something yeah. and they haven't. So it, The professionals it don't get, no. The time. professionals, when they get, the, what we need to do is go above the professionals' heads to the politicians. Ronald Wilson Reagan was the biggest cold warrior you'll ever meet in your life. <laughs> this is a man who did not like, I mean, they were the evil empire. That's he didn't right. like them, didn't want to like them. He's the kind of guy that joked, if you remember, thought the, 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 the microphone was off. I just ordered the missiles to fly against Russia. Ha, 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 ha. He's the guy who approved the plan in 1982 to blow up the Trans-Siberian Pipeline. Yeah, Do you remember that, did. Scott? Yep, you're, they, you're an old they, fart like us, so I don't remember blow it up. that. <laughs> they did blow it up. <laughs> yeah, we did blow it up. Now, we didn't we did find out up. until 2010 when a CIA agent they wrote finally, a book. They finally told the truth about it. And finally told the truth about it. So with all this talk about the Nord Stream Pipeline and Cy Hirsch's big article last week, I just wrote a piece today about the Trans-Siberian Pipeline yeah, explosion that everybody forgot about. At the time, it was the largest non-nuclear explosion on planet Earth. That's right. And Ronald Reagan authorized that. That's authorized how much it. he hated the Soviets. That's how much he hated. But mm -hmm. but and 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 I'll tell you what. In 1982, um, you know Paul Nietzsche, who was one of the, who was the INF negotiator, did his walk in the park with his uh, Soviet counterpart. And even though they hashed out an agreement, the system was so stultified that the agreement was put away. We just weren't going to have an agreement. A million people showed up in Central Park. I remember that. And when they showed Huge. up in Central Park in 1982, Huge. they sent a signal that Loud, the people clear. want this. And you know what happened? The system responded. Not the experts, not the Arms Control Association, not the guys with the ties and all that. The politicians Congress. who need the people to get elected. And they went, mm -hmm. um, we, need to, we need to respond. It took five years. But in 1987, they signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty. It works, ladies and gentlemen. It works. So let's do it again. And you know those treaties, just like when Kennedy and Khrushchev hammered out the nuclear test ban treaty, after the missile crisis, they put their heads together and said, you know, this is madness. We have to, we yeah. have to do something about it. And they tried to warm up the Cold War. We all know what happened after that. Kennedy was killed, Khrushchev removed from power. And then it didn't happen again for another 25 years when yeah. Reagan and Gorby were and finally Gorby able to sit down and see each other as human beings, just like you did Absolutely, with your friend yeah. in Russia. And once you've made that human connection, how do you, how someone, do you go to war how, against them? Yeah. How, how do you kill them? How, how do you go to war against them? How do you even consider uh, nuking their country? <laughs> you, once you've of, made yeah. that human connection, heart to heart, I, eyeball I a, to eyeball. I had a good friend uh, named uh, Robert Polk. Um, he's an author. Um, but he was also a diplomat, and he was uh, with Kennedy during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Oh wow! And he he was you know one of the guys that was in the middle of it all. Um, and he and I were going to write a book. Ooh. Unfortunately, he died. But yeah. we we're going to write a book, the What If book, because you know people write those books about history. What if this happened? What if you know? Mm -hmm. Alternate history. What we were going to write is what if Kennedy wasn't assassinated? Mm. What if uh, instead of being killed in Dallas, he lived? And what that meant for arms control, because as you just hit on it, because of the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
Kennedy and Khrushchev realized that this can't happen again, and they began a process. Start to have a dialogue. Of, of, of work. Kennedy created the Arms Control and Disarmament Agency. They were beginning this process of putting arms control mainstream, and then, bam, he got hit. Johnson came in and tried to resurrect it, but Vietnam got in his way. Yep. He, got, he, he got the civil rights thing. But the moment Johnson tried to bring arms control back, and then uh, I think the Soviets went into uh, Czechoslovakia, and so that ended it. And then mm. Carter tried to bring it back, but the Soviets went into Afghanistan, and that ended it. And it wasn't until Reagan and Gorbachev were able to get together in 87 to get arms control back on the on the agenda. But I just it think it could have happened in 1964, because I don't know if yeah. your friend knew this, who was around Kennedy then, but uh, several of Kennedy's closest advisors knew that he was planning a trip to Russia. After he got elected in 1964, he planned to make a state visit. That's what he was confiding yep. privately because he saw Fidel Castro make that big ballyhoo trip to the Soviet Union in 1963. And Kennedy was trying to smooth things over with Castro as well. And he saw how well received that visit was. And I think Kennedy thought, hey, I need to do that. I need to be the first American president in a generation to travel to the Soviet Union on a goodwill mission and to sit down. I mean, he'd already sat down with Khrushchev in Vienna two years earlier, yeah. but to go to Russia was a huge thing for an American president to do, to have that face to face, to have that eyeball to eyeball, that human connection. Well, and that's huge. the importance of the, of, of, of the, the power of the people, because right now a politician would think that it's suicide to do a state visit to Moscow right now. Right. You think Joe Biden's going to go have a visit with Putin over there? But, you know, maybe when this war is over and this war will end um, and, and both sides have a chance to reflect on just how close we came to making it all end. Um, politicians might be willing to make that, you know, take that risk if the people tell them we want you to. And again, that's why, something like this rally is so important because how else do you send a signal to the politician other than coming together and saying, we want you to do this. This is it what has we, to be a bipartisan coalition. Gaps, it, has to be. it can't be just the libertarians, tripartisan, yeah. quadripartisan. I mean, we need everybody. We need everybody. <laughs> you know, when I, when I look at this uh, rage against the war machine rally coming up, as I recall, looking at the poster, there are a whole bunch of different issues on there, not just arms control. Is right. that that yeah. part of the, the problem in trying to bring people together over there, do you think? It's not my problem, um, but it is part of the, One of the problems with an anti-war um, agenda is everybody, I, I mean, you have purists who just are straight up, I don't believe in war. Pacifists. Then you got people like me that says war is a necessity. Sometimes there are bad people out there. Uh, I got in trouble for uh, the tweet I sent out about uh, Atticus Finch. I said, "It's uh, a good tweet, though," I, and I agree with you. I love uh, I love dogs. I I, I own several. Mavericks become quite famous, um, you know. And um, I, I I would never hurt a dog, but if a rabid dog is running around the street, then it's got to be put down. And to put the rabid dog down, you need Atticus Finch. Um, who may look like a lawyer, but he was the best marksman in his unit during World War I. When the time came, he made the shot, took down the rabid dog. Um, and I said, Ukraine is a rabid dog and Russia is Atticus Finch. Um, and I firmly believe this. I um, too. But, you know, people say, well, you're not a, you're, you're not a, I never said I was a pacifist. You're not anti-war. I'm not. There are times when I believe war, unfortunately, has to be fought when there are rabid dogs out there. But I am anti-unjust war. Um, I believe that war should be the absolute last option, that you should exhaust every possible option short of war before going to war. Which um, we did not in this case. No, we we're not. not. We're just, we're, just we're, we're, but we're fighting for all the wrong reasons. I mean, it's, we, we're the ones, people need to understand, we started this war. Oh, yeah. Russia invaded. No, 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 no. This we war began it. long before this. Um, and it's always been the United, the intent of the United States to provoke Russia to enter Ukraine militarily so that Ukraine can be used as a proxy force to destroy Russia. We provoked the war. Scott, you're making that up. I don't know. William Burns wrote a memorandum in April 2008. Yet means yet. He said just what I just said. Not my words. It was the former ambassador. Of the Thank United you, WikiLeaks, for giving us that document. Again, yes. I mean, people are like, you know, Julian Assange. 
if it weren't for Julian Assange, we wouldn't have this document. That's um, right. We wouldn't know this. And imagine, again, see, right now I can put together a winning case about, you know, what America did. But I couldn't if WikiLeaks didn't exist. If we were at the mercy of the government spoon feeding us, then we'd accept at face value everything they're saying about what's going on. And we'd be in a hell of a situation. Yeah, and let's not forget that the same sort of, you know, sexual allegations were made once about Julian Assange and he he beat the rap. I believe he was innocent of those charges. And this is always what they do to silence anti-imperialism critics, people like you, people like Julian, our friend Caleb Oppen, he's had the same thing happen to him. If you speak up against these people, they're going to come for you. Yeah. You know, yeah. I'm waiting for them to come after me. They're coming after Rick as we speak. Our, our oh. website's been hacked several times lately, and we've just, he's had death threats. It's a himself. long and story. It's a long story, Scott. <laughs> you probably don't have time, but uh, we we understand how you feel. It, our, our experience has not been as bad as what they've done to you. What they've done to you is unforgivable. It outraged me so much that I had to reach out to you and invite you on the program today just to clear the air. I, I wanted to address this once and never mention it again. It's a, uh, You shouldn't even have to address it, but they've kind of forced you to. Um, well, I thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, and I hope, uh, you know, I, I hope, it as you said, I mean, I, I'll say this right now. Um, I'd like to be talking about moving forward Me too. Uh, to, to accomplish this journey that I want to go on. And, um, you know, I understand people can have concerns and I, I, I don't get angry at people who say, oh, I don't know. But I really do think we touched on it. I, I don't think we we didn't I avoid it. No, I would trust my daughters around you anytime. <laughs> totally. Well, I, look, <laughs> the, the irony is many people have, and there's never been a problem. So there you go. You know, there um, you go. So your your kids are safe at the rally, folks. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> well, wait a minute. <laughs> They're safe around me. From you. <laughs> you know? I can't vouch for the other crazies on the streets of uh, Washington DC. <laughs> you know? <laughs> my friends there tell me uh, they live in D.C. and I asked them to come to the rally this weekend and the crime, the random crime there is so bad. They have shootings in the metro all the time. They're like, yeah. I really want to go to this rally, but I'm scared to go to the rally just because of the random crime uh, that's present on the streets of D.C. They're afraid of that. Uh, and no, I can't it's say it's my, my daughter goes to school there and um, they're there is there's neighborhoods that are supposed to be safe and yet mm -hmm. you know a a a, a, a well-known man was leaving a restaurant a nice restaurant in a nice part of town and uh, he got gunned down uh ran, you know uh, because he got there was a drug deal that went bad and guns came out and so here you are uh taking your wife out to dinner in what's supposed to be a good part of town and you come out of the restaurant and bam shot gosh it's almost and, as if the government like Let's these violent criminals back out on the streets on purpose so that crime will go up, so that people will be afraid to leave their homes and go protest a war. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take my tinfoil hat off. I'll let it rip. go on. <laughs> no, I mean, anyway, it, Mr. Walker. It, it's, it's, yeah, we're, we're actually, is today the one year anniversary of, of the, the, the start of the war in Ukraine? No, 24th. 24th. Yeah. Okay. I knew we were getting close. We're getting close. Yeah. 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 Very we're going to have the. Uh... It's surprising to me that it's it's gone on this long. I, I guess. Yeah, I, Rick I... was expecting it to end quickly. I remember he asked me. So was I. Months ago, you think <laughs> this will be over fast? And I said, Nope. Nope. They're going to drag this thing on until it escalates to World War Three. They're going to try and drag China into it. They're going to try and have a rematch in North Korea. Uh, they want Korean War 2.0 too. Scott, what do you think about that? All the ramping up of of actions over there with Korea. I think it's stupid. Uh, you know, I'm not the biggest Donald Trump fan in the world. Um, I did vote for him because um, uh, I was even less of a Hillary Clinton fan. <laughs> and um, and um, I I think people understand my history of Joe Biden, so I wasn't going to vote for Joe Biden either. Um, <laughs> but you know, Donald Trump uh, has a lot of baggage um, and a lot of problems. But when when the system gives you two choices, uh, I picked him both times. Um, and one of the reasons is that he said, um, 
you know, that he thought we could be friends with Russia. And I said, well, that's good. And then he also said he doesn't know why NATO is still here. I said, well, OK, we're we're so far. We're doing all right. Um, and then he said, um, you said, I love WikiLeaks. <laughs> yeah, I love WikiLeaks. And why don't we work to get rid of North Korea's nukes uh, using diplomacy? Um, you know, here's Donald Trump, who everybody, you know, again, there, there's a lot there to not like about the guy. But he went out and he met three times with Kim Jong Un in an effort to get nuclear weapons off the table there to de-escalate to um to do so the best he was, things he did he was stopped by the establishment betrayed by mike pompeo and john bolton and i'm here to tell all the republicans out there uh if pompeo throws his hat in the ring don't vote for him oh, and nikki haley just threw her hat in the ring and john oh, no. and john bolton is supporting her don't support her uh, john bolton is evil mike pompeo's evil these guys conspired to uh, to block something that could have been wonderful a chance to take nuclear weapons out of the equation, end a war in Korea, and actually let peace break out all over. And that could have been Donald Trump's, you know, crowning achievement. But of course, we could have never allowed Donald Trump to have that crowning achievement. So they shut it down. They just, you know, they they attacked him, and you know, the the, the rest is history. But you know, Joe Biden, instead of trying to pick up the pieces of of, of Trump's failed effort and and run with it has made it worse. And we're now at a situation where North Korea is no longer not only not talking about denuclearization, they've doubled down on their nuclear program. They have a viable nuclear program now that's deterrent based. Um, but their whole thing is if we go to war, uh, Japan will no longer exist. South Korea will no longer exist. And guess what, America? you'll no longer exist too. They've made it very clear just this week in a statement that they will match us nuke for nuke. If nuke they're like, nuke. if you want to play games, United States, we will. And, and what most Americans don't understand is uh, every year, the United States holds these joint exercises with the South Koreans. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we do is we gather all our airplanes and all the South Korean airplanes and we fly straight to the demilitarized zone. Pyongyang, which is the capital of North Korea, is a very short flight from the DMZ. And we come in there, and the last second, we break off. But it's a bum rush towards the North Koreans out. Why? Because we're planning a decapitation strike. We're planning to go in there and swamp Pyongyang and kill Kim Jong-un in an effort to decapitate the leadership. And uh, that's the first thing. And so he's looking at it going, I don't like that, guys. So how do I protect against that? by guaranteeing that if I go, you all go with the nuclear weapon. And what Donald Trump did, one of the first things he said is, stop those exercises. This is really stupid. You know, for all the people that pick on Donald Trump, he did have some common sense mm -hmm. when it came to this kind of stuff. You know, the kind of common sense that comes when you're not an expert who's trapped in the history of being an expert. Um, he just didn't but, have sense enough not to hire the swamp, because then he turns around and hires guys like John Bolton. And that, was, that was the whole thing. Why not hire? But... <laughs> You know, it, it, look, again, he's not perfect. He made a lot of mistakes and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But, man, on certain things, he had good, you know. He had the right idea. Field. He had the right idea. When um, he followed his gut, he did the right thing. It was when people started talking to him then he, that he they didn't would have change the his mind. In it. That's right. You know, one of the other great things he did, I, I forever love him for this, <laughs> because Afghanistan, he came in, he said, this is a stupid war. We've been here forever. And the military came in, Mattis, and, you know, Mad Dog Mattis. Yeah. <laughs> Us, we can win this war. Really? You really? guys have been trying and you haven't won it yet. All you have to do is support us. Well, what do you need me to do? I need you to lift all the rules of engagement. Right now, our hands are tied. Lift the rules of engagement. We can do anything we want in there. Okay, I can do that. I'm the commander in chief. And give us more men and more money. Okay, here's more men. Here's more money. Rules of engagement lifted. Go. And I think, what, six months later, he called them all in and said, report card. Ah, you guys are still losing. Right. You suck. And he literally told all the generals around there, he said, you <laughs> suck at war. You guys aren't any good. You lose. And Mattis almost resigned there. He yeah. said, you insulted all the generals. And Trump's like, they deserve to be insulted. You guys After can't After 20 win. years, you can't win this war? You, you suck. Win. Okay. So you suck. that's when Trump said, we're out of here. We're pulling the plug. And... um you know, and the whole establishment freaked out. You can't leave. You can't run away. You can't do this. You know, and, and again, I'm not here to say that Donald Trump was perfect, but sometimes he did things where you just went, man, that was refreshing. 
<laughs> you know, have yeah. a president of the United States look the generals in the face who for 20 years say they can win a war but haven't won the war and tell them you suck at war. Boom. Because they do suck at war. They were horrible <laughs> at it. <laughs> they don't want it to end. They just want the money to keep flowing. The revolving door. You got to keep yeah. the military industrial complex alive and breathing so that when you retire from the military, you flip right in and you become a CEO at Raytheon or Lockheed Martin or Northrop Grumman. And um, and then you can flip it back and become an assistant secretary of defense or a secretary of defense like Lloyd Austin. It's literally just this revolving door of military madness. Do you think we're going to get to 2024? How close are we to a nuclear conflict right now, especially when it, it's very apparent that I think we're looking at a, an effort by the United States, NATO, to replace the regime in Russia through this war in Ukraine? Yeah, the good news is it's failing. Um, I mean, the Russians are pretty good. Um, and while they may have made some mistakes early on, they may have made some miscalculations, put too much faith and effort in negotiated settlement. I mean, it's funny how everybody's like, you know, the Russians refused to negotiate. Guy, that's all they were trying to do at the beginning. You know, four rounds, uh, the last of which would have resulted in a peace treaty had not NATO sabotaged it. Um, the Russians are done with negotiation right now, and they've assembled a force that's going to swamp the Ukrainians. And as Stoltenberg said, it's it's all over. I mean, I, I don't know how many people watched what he said yesterday, but um, in, in short, in a war that's defined by artillery, Ukraine is running out of artillery ammunition, and NATO can't resupply them. So they will literally run out of ammunition sometime this summer. And when that happens, it's all over. There's, there's nothing you can do at that point in time because... The Russians will just blow you up and you got nothing to fire back and that's for down you, mama. Um, so this, 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 this war will end. Um, Russia has done a very good job of escalation management, no matter how much, how much we provoke them. Russia has never taken the bait because they know they're going to win. Uh, so I'm not worried about the Russian thing. First of all, Russia will never use nuclear weapons preemptively. They'll never use nuclear weapons in Ukraine. Uh, even the worst scenario requires them to lose for that to happen. And they ain't losing. So, uh, you know, that's not the one that worries. The, the one that scares me to death is China and Taiwan and the ridiculous rhetoric that the United States is putting out there about coming to the assistance of Taiwan. We're literally provoking a fight so that we can get in a fight with China. Um, and what we don't understand or we haven't seemed to comprehend is that the Chinese will kick our butts. We are married to a legacy of military doctrine dating, uh, amphibious doctrine dating back to World War II. But the day of the big ships, the big group of the ships offloading Marines and, you know, rushing in doesn't work. Before you even get the Marines off the boat, all the ships are sunk because the Chinese have missiles now that reach out and touch you in long distance and we can't shoot them down. So our ships will get sunk. All our airplanes will get shot down coming in. And then we're left with what? When we have... 7,000 sailors go down to Davy Jones' locker, uh, there will be people talking about revenge. And the revenge will come in the form of a nuclear strike. Now, we'll con contend that it's a limited nuclear strike. It's a demonstration of America's will. But the second you use nukes, it's over. It begins the process of an exchange, and we all die. Um, and and look, look, the last time this thing almost got out of control is when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan. And now Kevin McCarthy's talking about making the same trip. I mean, again, thank goodness the Chinese are the adults in the room, and they hopefully won't buy into the bait. Um, the only good news is the Taiwanese government that currently uh, enjoys the support of the United States and uh, has been talking about moving in the direction of independence will probably lose the 2024 election now. The Kuomintang Party, the opposition party, did very well in the 2022 midterms. Um, and it looks like they're going to be able to continue this on. And if they get elected, uh, Taiwanese policy will, will definitely change. It'll, it, I don't know if they're going to just straight out agree to the uh, Chinese position of um, one system, two, or, you know, one nation, two systems, which China's basically said, all you have to do is say you're part of China and you, everything stays the same. You wake up the next morning, your life doesn't change. You continue to have your job, you have your government, you have your laws. We're not here to change that. We just need you to recognize that you belong to us. Um, but that's the direction they're going to head. Right now, the current government is headed in a completely different direction, trying to make Taiwan a de facto independent state from China. 
a Comintang government will go the other way, I think. And that takes all the pressure off because there's not much the United States can do at that point in time. So all we need to do is keep the United States from provoking a war between now and 2024. Um, that might be a tall order because we have idiots like General Minahan, uh, the commander of uh, Air Mobility Command, I believe his name is. Um, and he um, he's the guy that came out and said, I'm ordering my people to go out and shoot targets. Remember that? <laughs> he said, I believe there's going to be a war in 2025. Dude, you're the general of Air Mobility Command. You don't get to make that assessment. You're not qualified to make that assessment. That's a policy pronouncement. You should be fired on the spot, which normally would have happened, but they're not. He's also the guy that said, therefore, all my all my people in my command I need to go out with their pistol and uh, empty a clip at a target aiming for the head. Anybody who's qualified with a pistol in the armed forces know, A, it ain't a clip, it's a magazine, and B, uh, you enter, you, you shoot center mass. Uh, you don't empty our clip into the head. Um, so this guy's an idiot. Uh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. And yet he is part of this militarization of the conflict. I mean, look at the balloon. I'm here to tell you right now, we knew exactly what that balloon was the whole time. I was just going to ask tell, you about these balloons. I'm telling you the truth. Yeah. We knew what it was. It's a joint weather experiment that the Chinese have been running over the the, the, the the Tibetan plateau for many years using tethered balloons. But the data they collected there is, 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 is a snapshot of that one place. But if you look at the atmosphere, it circulates around the planet. And so what the Chinese have done in cooperation with the United States is develop these experiments or these you know, surveillance techniques to go up and gather you know, what's happening with water particles in the upper atmosphere. Because that has a that, that that plays a role in magnifying the sun and, and all this kind of stuff, um, and so the sensor goes up and it's supposed to collect. Now the sensor is on a balloon that has limited mobility. They talked about propulsion and rudders, but again, it's going to be pushed by the wind. The mobility is just to move it up a little bit down. Um, what happens when it breaks contact? And that's the other thing people need to understand here. Look at drones, American drones. We, we take off from the ground, and then we pass control off to a satellite, and then you have a guy thousands of miles away flying the drone. But if the satellite connection gets broke, the drone immediately goes into a search pattern, searching for the signal so that it can be recaptured and then brought back. This balloon apparently had the same thing. It lost contact, and if you take a look at what the balloon was doing over the United States, it was going in a rough search pattern. Now, it's tough because it's getting pushed by the wind, but it's a search pattern. And people are like, oh, look, they're spying on missile fields. No, they're not. It's a balloon on full automatic trying to make contact with the, the signal uh, and not able to do so. We knew this. Why? Because it's broadcasting a signal and we collect that signal. We know exactly what's going on. We know what this balloon was. This was a deliberate effort by the Biden administration to distract people from Seymour Hersh's outstanding a revelatory uh, article about Nord Stream and the United States attacking its ally, um, Germany. We don't want to talk about that. We do want to hype up the threat about China to distract the fact that Russia is getting ready to win the war in Ukraine. Um, so we take a balloon that we know exactly what it is, and we allow it to become this story. And then we order NORAD to fine-tune their radars so that they can detect all the other weather balloons that get put up in the air. And then we treat them as if they're a threat. We send airplanes up to shoot them down using 400,000 missiles, a $400,000 missiles. They're finally coming out saying, yeah, none of this is a threat. Uh, we, we know what these balloons are. They're not a threat. I don't know why we're shooting them down. Uh, they've never impacted an air. We shoot them down to protect civil aircraft. Really? Um, you've never shot one down before, and they've never brought down a civil aircraft. So why are you making this up? Why did you shoot down a balloon after it left the United States? If it's truly a spy balloon, you think you would have shot it down while it was spying on our missile silos. But we drifted off. We did it to militarize this, to create a sense of, uh, you know, a crisis. Um, and the Chinese are very mad at us right now. They're very mad at us for doing this. But uh, 
The fact of the matter is that wasn't a spy balloon. We know what that balloon was. We knew when we shot it down what it was. This is all just a stupid game being played by the Biden administration to divert attention away from stories they don't want you to focus on and then seek to militarize the Chinese problem because we don't have a diplomatic solution. That's the thing that should scare every American. We don't have a diplomatic solution. We needed to sink Tony Blinken's trip to China. So how do we do it? Shoot down a balloon. And then we blame it on the Chinese and say, we're not going to visit China while their balloons are you know, freelancing over our airspace. This is the this is this is the mindset of children, not adults. How important is this story about the the pipeline? How much impact do you think it ultimately will have, if any? Um, let me let me let me answer it this way. I printed the first page of Cy Hirsch's Substack where he published it, and um, I'm going to frame these because this is the most important story written this century. And it, it may hold to be the most important story written for the whole century. Uh, this story should bring down NATO. This story should result in Germany leaving NATO. This story should destroy your German-U.S. relations, and it may very well. This story hasn't ended yet. Uh, Cy Hirsch breathed life into a story that is going to resonate. It's going to have geopolitical consequence. Um, this is the literally the most important story out there because it's about American betrayal. It exposes the United States for what it is, an evil nation capable of doing evil. You know, we, 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 we on December 7th, you know, uh, 1941, the Japanese launched a surprise attack against the Americans in Pearl Harbor. It became a day that lived in infamy. On September 22nd, uh, 26th of last year, Joe Biden ordered the economic Pearl Harbor attack on Germany. The, the equivalent, $12 billion piece of critical energy infrastructure, we attacked it without provocation, without justification, without any legal, um, you know, th there was no legal permission to do this. It was a blatant act of war that not only was a violation of our own constitution when it comes to uh, congressionally, you know, congressional approval for an act of war, Joe Biden conspired to avoid reporting to Congress. Again, that becomes a crime. He should be impeached. This is a clearly an impeachable offense. Nobody's talking about it in the United States. This is why Hirsch's article got published because people are ignoring this. He published it. Look at the first major interview he did. It was in Germany. And look what's happened because of that interview. German politicians are now on the floor of the Bundestag talking about this issue. It ain't going away. Russia's convening an emergency council a meeting of the Security Council to talk about this issue. China is now going to weigh in on this issue. Why? Because an 85-year-old hero wrote an article, the most important article anybody's going to read this century. This is the article, ladies and gentlemen. This, this is going to resonate. That's how important this article is. I mean, I knew it was important, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't appreciate the depth, the gravity of it. Uh, oh, the, the, the German, the German, the German parliament. Uh, there's a very brave uh, uh, female parliamentarian. Uh, oh, wasn't uh, she great the other day? The, 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 the Kurdish lady. Um, yeah, I can't uh, think Sivesh, of her name. I think her name is. Um, but she was up there, and she basically read the the Schultz government the riot act about this, and it's yeah. because of Seymour Hersh's article that she did it. Um, and, and there are other German politicians now who are frankly saying, um, because of Seymour Hirsch, we now have to address this issue. And if what Seymour Hirsch wrote is true, and it is, um, we can't be members of NATO anymore. We can't be members of NATO. We can't be allies with the United States. Think about what I just said. The most important economic power in Europe was attacked by the United States. And if they get if they are able to shake off their um, current status as cuckolds, because that's what they are. It's a cuckold nation right now, uh, letting the United States do whatever they want to do. And we just pretend that we don't know about it. And we just go on and allow the abuse to occur. It's a cuckold nation. But now, thankfully, some politicians are stepping up saying, no more. We're not doing that. Uh, we're calling it is what it is. There's going to be an investigation. And the United States stabbed Germany in the back. And when that becomes reality, and it will, it's going to resonate in Germany in a way that's going to terminate this friendship. How can you be friends with somebody who did that to you? Um, and Germany, I believe, is going to leave NATO 
and that will lead to the collapse of NATO. That will lead to the collapse of the EU. That will this has, has the potential to be one of the greatest geopolitical uh, events in history. Talk about unintended consequences. When old Sleepy Joe uh, got up there on February seventh of last year, and of twenty twenty one or twenty twenty two, I'm sorry, and said, um, "You know, if Russian tanks move into Ukraine. Uh, Nord Stream two is is going to go away." And, and the German journalist was like, "But." But, but but how could you do that? It's a, it's a German piece of thing. It's German. And he went, it's going to happen. Well, it did happen. And now the Germans are pretending he never said that. I mean, it's just like, no, see no evil, hear no evil, say no evil. But fortunately, do these people said, even realize the internet exists? It's like they think this stuff just goes away if they deny away. it. The internet but never. I heard wrote an article, <laughs> and the Germans have to deal with this article now. That's the importance of this article. Yes. And it took an old school journalist like Sai, who's like you said, 85 years old, yeah. to do real journalism because yep. and he had to publish it on crowd Substack. seems to have any curiosity about this. He had to publish it on Substack. Mm -hmm. Because the New York Times not, wasn't interested. Washington New York Post Times not interested. Washington, Washington yeah. Post not interested. You know, this is Seymour Hirsch who won a Pulitzer Prize for exposing my life. This is yeah. Seymour Hirsch who has uh, exposed uh, horrific abuses by the U.S. intelligence community. This is Seymour Hersh, who more recently exposed the Abu Ghraib thing. When nobody else would tell the story, Seymour Hersh told the story. Now, the New Yorker published that piece at that time, but the New Yorker has lost its, you know, nobody will touch Sai right now because the truth is no longer what people are looking for. They're looking to spin things. And so here's the greatest investigative journalist in our history. This man is a living legend. He's a national treasure. He's an international treasure. And he's probably the best we've still got living. He's the only thing we still got. Mm. Um, he, and at 85, Amazing. he cares enough about the truth that he put himself in this situation. If you think Cy Hirsch needs attention, you don't know Cy Hirsch. And I'll just say this for the audience. I know Cy Hirsch. We've been friends for 25 years. Um, and yeah, I didn't know he was going to write this article. I, I I knew that he was thinking about going to Substack, but he didn't want to. He didn't want to go to Substack, but he did it because that was the only way to get this thing published. So he did it. It got published. And oh my God, what a story. Now, people are going to try and take it apart at the seams. Right now, there's this whole, um, they call themselves OSINT, uh, Open Source Intelligence Community. Let me tell you about OSINT. Uh, we can call them something else, NAFO. They're basically NAFO. They are kind they're of the NAFO. same thing, aren't they? They're the same thing. And they think they're so smart. They think they can say they, this, that, and the other thing. Hey, guys, if you lived in the real world, you'd understand that tracking the transponder on a ship doesn't tell you jack squat about the ship. If you had ever worked in the CIA's paramilitary group, special operations or special activities uh, staff, Sea Branch. They actually have a thing called C branch. And you know what they do in C branch, you morons? They put <laughs> false transmitters, uh, on, you know, beacons on things that float around to make it look like something's happening, uh, or they shut beacons off on the things they don't want you to see. You see, the CIA is 400 million times smarter than you oh, sense snotty nosed punk ass kids who don't know anything because you've never done nothing except live in your mother's basement and, uh, and search the internet thinking you're smarter than everybody. There's a real world out there full of people who know how to do real world things that you don't have a clue about. And so- yeah, They're the ones who like to quote Wikipedia and go, actually. And, and, guess who, and guess who actually did do real world stuff? Cy Hirsch. Yes. Do your research on the man before you criticize him. This is a guy who from the 1960s until today, has had the best connection with the U.S. intelligence community than any other journalist out there. And it's not the connection of a Bob Woodward. Bob Woodward has an incestuous relationship. Exactly. Where He's he part sits of down and becomes a stenographer. You tell me, I write it down the way it is, and I publish it, so we're all happy. I make money, you look good, you get your story out, all that. Cy Hirsch's thing is, I tell the truth. And he goes, and you know, to be fair, I mean, Cy, because he does work with the intelligence community, he's been fed some some bullshit Everybody cover has. stories through the years, Everybody and he's has. been duped, and a lot yeah. of journalists have been duped. He was duped on that uh, JFK book he did the, the, back on, in on, 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 Dark Side of Camelot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but he and, admits, you know, they will feed you false stuff, but I think yeah. Cy generally gets it right, and he's got a good bullshit detector. 
No, well, so, that's the whole thing too. Remember, the Dark Side of Camelot was written a long time ago. That's right. Um, and the thing about professionals is when you make a mistake, you learn from the mistake. And uh, you know, Sai hasn't made that mistake. He has learned uh, that you have to, you know, double, double, double all that. And he got burned on another thing too. Uh, more recently, um, uh, he may be right on this story, but the way it was he's presented. Yeah, he was. I think he was right on that. I'm not going to get in because that's his business. But yeah. a source led him down the wrong path, and he said some things that may have been right, but the way the source described it wasn't quite right, and it, it, it put Sai in a very uncomfortable situation. Um, so yeah, is he the perfect journalist? There's no such thing as a perfect journalist no because there's no such thing as the perfect person. No human human being is infallible, and if you do anything in your life, you're going to make mistakes. But the, at least the, he endeavored. He tried. He's trying, and and on the story like this. Uh, if I, if I know him and I do, um, I can't say I have any insight cause I don't, I can't sit here and tell you guys that I got the inside scoop, but I'm betting that let, let's put it this way. Size, the kind of reporter and I'm an intelligence guy. I'm actually the real deal when it comes to OSINT because I do open source intelligence based upon an extensive real world experience where I can cut through the BS. Um, and get down and say, that smells right, that doesn't smell right. The thing about Seymour Hersh's reporting, and I used to do this for a living, uh, take reports and then break them down and reverse engineer them to see what the sources were. And there's a lot of reporters out there who think they're being clever about hiding their sources. And it just becomes painfully obvious as you read the article and you see how they do it, you go, that's where it came from. 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 They they suck as journalists because they literally just expose their sources. Yep. You will never find Cy Hirsch's source. Ever. Oh, they're trying so hard to pry it out of him too. But the way he writes, and he doesn't they do can it prosecute dishonestly. them. Yeah, they, he doesn't do it dishonestly. But the way he does it is, for instance, let me let me let me just speculate here. He says, "I have this one source that's wonderful." That may not be the primary source. There might be five other sources, but he's not going to talk about them because he is just de deflecting you. He's not changing the data, but you're going to be going down the wrong path. You're going to be looking for something that doesn't exist. Everything. That's how clever this guy is. He will never, you will never be able to identify a, a Seymour Hearst source ever. And uh, the reason is he's damn good at his job. And so, and that's why people go to him. You have to ask yourself, this guy's 85 years old. He's been around the block. Why, why do you people done this? talking to him? Because they know he's going to tell the truth and they know he's not going to burn them. That if Cy Hirsch receives them, that they're going to be protected. So for all you little oh cent snotty nose kids out there in your mama's basement, um, good hunting. You ain't going to figure out the source. And Seymour Hirsch is smarter than you will ever be. And he has more integrity right there in that little pinky than you've got in your entire body. And, you know, the good thing about what he's done here, I hope he's started a fire. And I hope he's, you know, stoked the curiosity of other journalists to look into the Nord Stream case more and to do more work on it, either to prove him right or to prove him wrong. But at yeah. least he got the conversation started. <clears throat> no? Yeah. Well, I, you know, but that's the journalist as I, as I said to Rick, um, the conversation in, uh, in Germany right now ain't about journalists. <laughs> this has been politicized. And there's going, to be a constant, there's going to be a conversation in the Security Council soon. Russia's demanding it. Um, yes, and are. it's all because of Cy Hirsch. So this isn't only about trying to get American journalists to do the right thing. Good luck. I don't see that happening. Um, not with the mainstream. Hopefully there will be some echo, not echo chamber. I don't like that term, but in the alternate uh, media things, such as you, Lori and Rick, and maybe me and other people will write about this uh, and we'll use common sense and logic to connect the dots and come up with, you know, something that, that helps uh, resonate what Cy Hirsch has started. Uh, but, in, you know, the mainstream media is going to ignore this until it becomes political where they can't ignore it. And in Germany there right now is, I believe a drive for an official investigation. And, um, Certainly hope so. Watch, watch the New York Times ignore that story when the German government officially comes out and says America attacked us, stabbed us in the back, 
economic Pearl Harbor. You can't ignore that story in New York Times. You can't ignore that one. Yeah, because they've already run out of UFOs to shoot down. <laughs> they're <laughs> running out of distractions really quick. So they're going to yeah. have to face the music sooner or later. And you're right. It is an impeachable offense, clearly impeachable offense. And yet no one's going to impeach Joe Biden, I say, because he's got impeachment insurance. Nobody wants President Harris. I mean, we're talking about the worst, least popular vice president since Dick Cheney. She scares the hell out of everybody. And everyone's like, let's just hang in there for one more year until we can vote him out. But nobody wants President Harris. Well, the thing about vote. Biden is you know, he's probably the most corrupt individual we've ever elected to be president of the United States. Boy, but that's he, saying something, too. And, yeah, but he, <laughs> you know, this is the Delaware senator. Think about it who helped make Delaware the place to go to incorporate business. Mm -hmm. So every money-making establishment in America is indebted to Joe Biden. That's why he's not going to get touched because yes. Mr. Corruption is the man who corrupted America. Um, when he dies, and it will be sooner than later because he's got advanced dementia. He's not going to be around a long time. He's deteriorating right before our eyes. Oh, it's um, so then people won't be intimidated by him anymore. And I think you're going to be shocked by the stories that will come out about Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. But right now, while he's alive, uh, there's too many people in, uh, in high places that, um, that if, 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 if they were to investigate him, it would spread to them. The whole so house of cards would come down. With everything it. comes down. So I don't think there's going to be any meaningful investigation into, into Joe Biden. Not while he's alive. Not while he's president. Damn it. I agree with you. I agree with you. I don't want to on that one, but I, I'm afraid. No, I mean, uh, who wouldn't? I mean, I think the man should be impeached. They won't be. Congress isn't going to impeach him because they all owe their wealth to Joe Biden. Similar situation to what we had with Bush, George Bush the second. I mean, yeah. because of, uh, you know, he was so well protected by the corporate interests that really run things. Um, of course, he wasn't going to be impeached. And you remember when the Democrats took took Congress back in 2006, Nancy Pelosi became House Speaker you know, saying that she might uh, file articles of impeachment against Bush and that they were going to impeach him. And then they didn't. They didn't. Well, they Nancy talk a good game because, to get elected, but then they don't. Call. Nancy knew that uh, people would start digging into her. That's um, right. But take a look who they did impeach twice. Exactly. The one guy who didn't have the establishment on his side. Yep. So they went after him. Um, but if you got the establishment on your side, you're untouchable. 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 Yeah. Where, where, are we at with, where, where are we at right now with this situation in Ukraine? Um, yeah, we, we haven't gotten to like that. Winter offensive and, um, well, you know, it's kind of the stories over there, again, you know, not not front and center, at least here where, I, from where I'm, I'm at. Anyway, I'm not seeing as much media attention. It's hard to keep track. Gee, you know, I wonder they're, why they're, they're not talking about it all of a sudden, Scott. Well, they're, they're not talking about it because it's over. And they know it's over. I mean, all you had to do is listen to Jan Stoltenberg um, stutter his way through his speech yesterday, mm -hmm. um, where he said what I've been saying all along. Uh, you know, in, in September, I, I just want to remind people in September, I said that the Ukrainians just burned through their entire reserve force. They got nothing left and they're out of ammunition. Uh, they don't have enough ammo. And when you don't have ammo, you die. Apparently, um, we're running out of ammunition to send them, too. Well, that's the that's what I meant. I mean, mm -hmm. so Stoltenberg sitting there, you know, finally, uh, you know, the 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 military accountant came up to him and said, "We're done." And you know, oh, the, <laughs> the Ukrainians showed up at uh, in, in Ramstein for the I think the tenth meeting of the uh, of the Ukrainian contact group, and they thought they were going to come in there and say, "We need jet airplanes and we need more tanks, and you guys are going to give it to us because you know politically we're on the high thing," and. Uh, Lloyd Austin and and Mark Mealy had to go time out. Um, now that ain't the narrative we're talking about anymore because we got some hard truths. Um, we're out of ammunition. We got nothing left to give you, and you're going to run out of ammunition this summer. And we can't change that outcome, and you're going to lose the war. And that's straight up what they told them. Straight up, you're going to lose the war because without ammunition, you can't win the war, and we literally can't turn this around. Stoltenberg. Meanwhile, said, Russia doesn't seem to have any shortage of ammo. No, or artillery pieces or anything. They, I mean, Russia just completed this big, massive mobilization, mm -hmm. uh, and they're getting ready to 
bring it to engage. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, already burned through their reserves. What they're they, they, they're, you know, they're scripting trying, anyone with a pulse at this point, aren't they? They have no choice. They have other people getting trained, but on what? On you know, fourteen Challenger two tanks, they'll be gone in a week. Fourteen uh, German uh, Leopard two A sevens, they're gone in a week. Uh, there's there's just not enough to 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 bring this about. The Russians have everything. The Ukrainians have nothing. This is an artillery war. The head of the uh, U.S. Um, uh, the forces in Europe, who's also the Supreme Allied Commander, uh, uh, General Cavoli, I think his name is, uh, spoke in Sweden last month. And um, he said the following. He said, uh, what's going on in Ukraine right now is on a scope and scale that was beyond our imagination. We're not prepared for this fight, meaning we being NATO. NATO can't fight this fight. NATO can't win this fight. And he said, this is about artillery ammunition. This is about big guns. We weren't prepared for this. We never thought we were going to be doing this. What the Russians are doing is something that we can't handle. The Russians have all this ammunition. Uh, they're, they're firing 20,000 rounds a day, evened out. Some days it's up to 60,000. Some days it's down to 8,000. But on Christ. average, 20,000 rounds a day. Um, he said, we don't have the ammunition. We can't do it. There were a million rounds. And the, the United States had a million rounds in reserve, a million. Um, Ukraine is firing, I think, 110,000 rounds every 10 days. So in a month, they fire 330,000 rounds. In three months, they exhaust our million round reserves. We can produce 100,000 rounds in a month. They're expending 110,000 rounds in 10 days. So they are burning through ammunition three times quicker than we can replace it. We run out of all our ammunition options this summer where we have nothing there's nothing to give the ukrainians they have nothing and with no ammunition in a war like this you will die and lose the war this is what's going to happen in this conflict russia is going to win decisively this summer because ukraine will run out of everything including manpower by the way <laughs> here's what i understand scott the math seemed pretty obvious from the start of this whole conflict so why didn't NATO and the United States do that math before entering the conflict? I think there was, a, first of all, I think everybody thought that um, Russia was going to invade Ukraine uh, doctrinally. I mean, Mark Milley briefed Congress that 72 hours, this thing's over. The yep. director of the CIA told Biden one week, it's all over. And had Russia come in doctrinally, it would have been all over. But Russia didn't. Right. Russia wasn't looking to militarily defeat Ukraine. Russia was looking to get Ukraine to the negotiating table to come up with a solution that Russia had been trying to get the West to buy into before they invaded. You know, the Minsk Accords, um, it, it, the, the draft treaties they delivered to NATO and the United States on December 17th of 2021. Um, the West turned their back on them, betrayed Russia. So what Russia did is move in, but they called it a special military operation for a reason. It wasn't war. It was something other than war designed to get Ukraine to the table, and it worked. Ukraine had three negotiations in early March, led to the fourth and final negotiation, one April in Istanbul, Turkey, where there would have been a peace treaty signed, except Boris Johnson, at the behest of the United States, flew in and canceled it. Um, you, Russia's been looking for a negotiated settlement from the very beginning. Russia's the only, party, the only person looking for a negotiated settlement. But they were betrayed. And then NATO turned around and pumped in tens of billions of dollars of uh, equipment to rejuvenate a defeated, fundamentally defeated Ukrainian military, which then went on in the offensive in September. And everybody remembers that. Kharkov recaptured, the right bank of Kherson recaptured, Ukrainians saying their Tarzan shit yell. But what nobody picked up on was they all died. But yeah, they took that territory, but the Russians didn't lose hardly anybody. They sort of withdrew, consolidated defensive line. The Ukrainians went in and got slaughtered by Russian artillery. That big vaunted reserve force they had all died. All the tanks that they were given, hundreds if not thousands of tanks from Poland and elsewhere, all destroyed, and they got nothing left. And NATO's going, whoops, that was sort of it, guys. That was the big push. You needed to win, and you didn't. And now what you did is you pissed off the Russians because the you Russians don't want to do that. No, the Russians, there's that old saying, uh, History you know, the Russians that. are slow to harness, but fast to ride. Thanks to 
what we did, Russia mobilized 300,000 reservists, another 200,000 volunteers, 500,000 in total joining 200,000 already in the field for 700,000. You have the Belarus military, uh, that's a couple hundred thousand up there. And the Ukrainians had their 700,000 man military squandered down to 200,000, a little over 200,000 today. Do people understand that in less than a year, Ukraine has suffered more deaths than the United States suffered in all of World War II? In all of World War II, uh, defeating Imperial Japan, working with the Russians and others to defeat Nazi Germany, the United States suffered around 300,000 dead. Ukraine has suffered around 350,000 dead so far. They've lost um, a generation. And then the, you know, the wounded uh, are there. They, they've suffered all these, and they've got nothing left, nothing left. And the Russians, meanwhile, are getting ready to come in like Genghis Khan. And um, I, I, I mean, on the one hand, I don't feel sorry for the Nazis. I hope they all die, and I hope their deaths are painful, and I hope they're soon. Um, because you have to. You have to eradicate them in a way that makes anybody who thinks they want to be a Nazi realize they don't want to be a Nazi. Which leads me to my next question. I know we're over time, so I'll make this my last. But now that Russia's committed, and they are committed, and they're going to be sending in hundreds of thousands more and moving westward, I know it was not Putin's goal when he started this thing to take the entirety of Ukraine. He wanted to protect the independent republics in yeah. eastern Ukraine. But the stated goal of this whole special military operation, part of that goal was to denazify Ukraine. And historically speaking, at least for 100 years or longer, the Nazis have always been in the western part of Ukraine. And so how can you really be sure that you have neutralized the threat once and for all without taking Western Ukraine? Do you think that that will be ultimately once the Russians come in full bore that they won't stop until they have basically taken the entire country? There's a lot of um, well-placed Russian officials, um, civilian and military, uh, who have said that this won't end until Russian eyeballs are on the Ukrainian-Polish border staring the Poles in the face. Um, and I understand the emotions behind that statement, but 700,000 troops isn't enough to take Ukraine. It's a huge country. Um, it's enough to do what the Russians need to do to destroy the Ukrainian military. It's enough to take Kharkiv. It's enough to, or Kharkov, if you're Russian. It's enough to take Odessa and link up with Transnistria. It's enough to liberate the four uh, recently acquired territories, all of their territory, plus push 150 kilometers inward, thanks to the United States. The Russians were only going to go 80, but because we provided the Ukrainians with longer range systems, the Russians have said, you will never again be allowed to, to, to hit Russian territory. So they're going to go 150 kilometers in um, and destroy the Ukrainian military. Um, they have sufficient forces to do that, but to cross over the Dnieper River and then drive into Western, that's, that's a lot of territory. Uh, they don't have enough troops to do that. At least I don't believe. I mean, again, I don't, I, who knows what arrows are being drawn on Russian maps? Who knows? From a military perspective, I don't see them being able to do that, even with the large force they have in Belarus. I think the Belarusian force is more of a force of deterrence uh, to keep Poland out of Western Ukraine and to pin the Ukrainians down in Kiev. Uh, but who knows? Uh, on on February, February 21st, Putin's given a speech. And uh, I think he's going to make some things pretty clear. Some people are talking about uh, there might be a union uh, that the Belarus will come back into the Russian Federation. I, I don't know if that's true or not. But if it does, suddenly those Belarusian troops become Russian troops. And uh, that changes the political equation. And those troops can now be engaged. Uh, right now, uh, Lukashenko has made it clear that he doesn't want Belarus forces in Ukraine. Um, and Putin has respected that so far. But who knows, once once the union uh, legalities change, what Russia will do. But I think Russia is not looking to occupy the entire country. That's a difficult task, and it leads to a never-ending conflict. I think Russia wants this war over. And the way you do that is to destroy the Ukrainian military, which I believe they'll be able to do by the end of summer, early fall of this year. And then you have to denazify. And the way you denazify, at least in Scott Ritter's world, is um, what they appear to be doing. 
they they took you know general uh sort of like in the general armageddon who stabilized the front and then uh the russians then restructured the general staff to uh reflect the reality that this is a massive offensive they're getting to run on several fronts and sir viking was given uh control of the air campaign which means the air campaign is now a standalone campaign to do what to destroy ukraine as a modern nation state to knock out its uh electrical grid and take out its infrastructure to collapse it as a society why why would you go that route because mm. when you collapse ukraine as a society uh, Zelensky becomes politically unviable. And uh, the idea is to bring down the Zelensky regime internally, have the Ukrainians take care of this problem, and then to replace Zelensky with somebody who will accept the Russian terms of surrender. And um, one of those terms will be, of course, the uh, a new constitution that outlaws banderism, uh, makes step on bandera the name that you cannot say. Now you're talking. Animals blow up the monuments, outlaw the political parties, yes. et cetera. This, this has to be a Ukrainian solution, not a Russian solution. Ukraine has to do this. But in order to do that, you have to bring down Zelensky. And when you collapse society to the point that Zelensky's out, society is going to turn on those who made this war possible, and that is the Banderists. That is Bandera supporters. That is the Sloboda party. That is the right sector. That and is they've been the cancer in Ukraine for a hundred years, these yep. Ukrainian nationalists. Surely not all of the Ukrainian people are on board with what they do. They've been no. nothing but trouble. Nothing but trouble. But again, I'm not saying that 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 approach will ultimately succeed. I mean, the problem with ideology is how do you stamp out ideology? Um, right. You know, and 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 it's been there for a while in Western Ukraine. It's literally that is poison territory. They were um, Nazis before there was a Nazi party in they, Germany. They were, when you trace yeah. this back to They're World bad, War bad. One, those guys were already there and already had their their Nazi beliefs before Nazi was even a word. Bad, before there was bad a, people. Yeah. Bad people. So, right. you know, the Petula days, I think they call them. You know, this is mm -hmm. the, the original founder of the of this movement uh, of Ukrainian yes. nationalism. Um, right. Long before anyone ever heard of Adolf Hitler. Yeah, they were doing this stuff. They were they were the white Jim supremacists. Pogrom. They were the ultra-nationalists. They mm -hmm. murdered people. Um, yes, so it, it's a Ukrainian solution. I, you know, I can't guarantee that outcome. I don't think anybody can. It's, it's a political problem that requires a long-term approach. But I think what Russia will say is that um, they at least will get Ukraine on the path towards denazification. Um, and that has to be done without a Russian occupation. That has to be a Ukrainian solution. Um, and that's going to take time. See, I think Russia is going to demilitarize Ukraine sometime in the August, October timeframe of this year. Um, and I think that will also bring about probably a change in the government in Kiev. But the political solution is going to be longer because Russia, if Russia dictates a solution to Ukraine, at the point of a gun. Um, the West isn't going to accept it. So right. what 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 Russia is going to have to do is find a way to get the West to work with Russia to create a post-conflict Ukrainian government that um, mm. isn't going to be, um, you know, A, isn't going to be a cancer to Russia, but B, isn't going to be this economic black hole for uh, for Europe. So you mean it's like we were supposed to do after World War II? Wasn't that what the United Nations yeah. in Nuremberg was supposed to be all about? And then, and then somehow those those Nazis just kind of got away, and they immigrated to Canada, and they came to the United States, and they went to South America. And I think we only prosecuted what twenty two at Nuremberg. Not enough. Yeah, not enough. Not and enough. you know, Stalin did his best to hunt them down and try to get the last of them, but. Yeah, denazification is a bitch. Let it's going to be a. It's we wouldn't be, be a here problem. today talking about fascism in the 21st century yeah. had we done it correctly back in 1945, 46, 47. But instead, Winston Churchill decides he wants to do Operation Unthinkable. Yeah, <laughs> and he wants to stab his ally in the back, right, and invade the Soviet Union. And then he used and the CIA here in the United States, starting around 1947, the very beginning of the agency, started cozying up to these Ukrainian nationalists, started cozying up to Stefan Bandera, who had a CIA code name. Yep. 
Jacob, Nicola Labed, also had a CIA code name. Alan Dulles personally recruited Labed, brought him to the United States, set him up in New York City, where he lived a long, happy life, despite the fact that he had a murder conviction as a war criminal. And uh, the CIA protected him. We protected a lot of them. And that's how we got here today, because they were all useful during the Cold War, doing guerrilla warfare against the Soviet Union. We were trying to destroy it and do regime change. And we're just repurposing that same old plan as far as, you know. The interesting thing is the CIA was um, assisted by an organization called the Galen Organization. Yes, sir. Which is a Nazi intelligence officer who operated the intelligence organization on the East Front against the Soviets and uh, had a huge network of stay behind assets, a lot of whom, many of whom were uh, Banderas, Stefan Banderas people. And so Galen, a Nazi who should have been prosecuted for war crimes and killed, uh, instead became the head of the German intelligence service, uh, working for the CIA, et cetera. And so people ask, you know, why is Germany doing this? Uh, Because it was never cleansed. Germany was never cleansed. And I get in a lot of trouble when I say this, but scratch a German, you get a Nazi. Um, You're absolutely right. I mean, all you have to do is study some history and it's uh, so obvious. So clear. You know, so in, in, in order to get rid of that, I mean, when you talk about the problem of denazification in Ukraine, understand, uh, you know, we have the problem of uh, incomplete denazification in Germany, mm-hmm. um, where many people were allowed to uh, become mainstream in the post-war uh, economy, in the post-war uh, uh, politics, the post-war, um, you know, military. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot of German officers there in the 1950s who were you know, supporters of the Nazi regime in the 1940s. Absolutely. Um, they went on to you know, occupy positions in government and everywhere. everywhere. You had a couple of outliers like Willy Brandt, yeah. um, who, who did the right thing uh, in 72. He went to Warsaw, fell on his knees, uh, begging forgiveness for the crimes that were committed. Um, but a lot of Germans weren't happy about that. They weren't happy mm-hmm. that he, you know, showed uh, resentment for this. Um, and today we have literally... Uh, you know, the, the nexus of German um, nationalism, uh, industrialism, and militarism coming together once again to send uh, German tanks that are named after cats over to Berlin to kill Russians. I mean, you know, did we not remember what happened to the panther? What happened to the tiger? Why are we sending leopards? Um, this, is, this is just stupid. You can know, I, ask, I, I just I felt... Ask, oh, I, go ahead, Rick. Go ahead. Yeah. Here in Canada, we have a history of i guess hiding nazis Mm -hmm. and uh i see signs of fascism becoming prominent again especially over the last month fashionable Um, even yes so i'm i'm hoping that maybe scott you can help our viewers especially here in canada by telling them how we might recognize the warning signs. People have cli- a cliched image of what a Nazi is. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's people who kill Jewish people. But it's, it's more complicated than that. And so I'm, can I just throw it to you to explain in your own way what you think people should be looking for when we're trying to identify the the danger, the threat of fascism emerging in our society. And I hope I'm not putting you on the spot too much, but I guess I'm really asking for a definition of fascism. But more than that, what are the warning signs? Because personally, I'm, I think I'm seeing it. And uh, it's more complicated than a Steven Spielberg cliche Nazi who just, you know, is an evil dude in a black suit. Doesn't have to have a little mustache. Right. No, no. <laughs> I mean, real and German. A, a key, a key element of, um, I mean, fascism is, of course, it's it's the nexus of um, of of industry and uh, and government uh, wrapped in nationalism. Um, uh, it, it 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 may not have overt racism, but there's a racial aspect to, to a, a, a sort of a purity test. And Canada, unfortunately, which its history is, um, I mean, 
what Canada did to the First Nation. Um, you know, the, the history of abuse of the, uh, of the first, I don't know, is it First Nation, First People? Um, first Nations. First Nation, yeah. In the United States, you know, we, we of course don't even give them that honor. They're just Indians. Uh, you know, but um, the, you know, the, the, the abuse that, that occurred there. Uh, so Canada is already prone to, uh, whether they recognize it or not, it's, uh, it's, it's a racist society. The Canadians will say, we're not racist. Well, you are. Um, you, you, you are, you treated the, the first nations very badly and you continue to do so. Um, and then what happens is you allow infiltration. And one of the great infiltrations that taken place in Canada and Canadian history is what happened after uh, world war II with the Western Ukrainians fleeing and being brought into Canada and allowing to establish themselves as communities without question. Um, I, I have no problem with people coming into a country and being integrated, um, but integration means that they sort of drop the prejudices that they enter into and they buy into, um, you know, what, what you're supposed to be. In America, that's what's supposed to happen. It doesn't happen, but it's supposed to happen. But in Canada, you allow these communities that are hate-filled with our horrific records. I mean, we're, we're talking about uh, people, mass murderers, slaughtering Jews, slaughtering Poles, slaughtering Russians coming in and allowing to establish themselves intact and continue the practices. I mean, this is where somebody like um, uh, Christ, Christa Freeland, Christa Freeland. Uh, you, you have to, you have to yeah. look at her, not only is her grandfather uh, a, a documented Nazi supporter who came over here and, and everybody knew who he was, but they pretended he wasn't. They pretended he was this upstanding. So he's not an upstanding. So he's a Nazi supporter. Um, she, you know, entered these, the, this youth movement. Um, I, I can't, I can't remember the exact name of it. Yeah, it's like the Canada yeah. Banderite youth yeah. organization. But, but the whole thing is yeah. they worship Bander. They, they worship mm -hmm. Stefan Bander. They, they sing his praises. They have summer camps. She, she, you know, the way they disguise, they say that we, um, we study Ukrainian language and we study Ukrainian history and culture. When we, we try to get an appreciation for history and culture. Really? No, I think you study the writings of Stepan Bandera and you indoctrinate the kids into it. They carry his, uh, his, his photograph around in torchlight parades where you wear uniforms that are literally the direct descendant of the brown shirts worn by, you know, the SD and the SA during the development of Nazi Germany. Um, and society ignores this. Society ignores this. Uh, Canadian society ignores this. So, um, you know, Canada is, is a nation that, you know, has people who believe that uh, they're free, but you can't be free in a society that condones uh, this kind of, of hatred. And then as Canada becomes stressed, you, you see the government behaving in ways that are very anti-democratic, uh, that, that, um, you know, that, that pretty much fall in line with um, Bandera thinking. So if you allow Banderas to promote Banderism and then integrate themselves into your government, don't be surprised when stressed, your government falls back on the, the default, which is Bandera ideology. Um, it's the same thing in the United States when we talk about racism. You know, it keeps saying Jim Crow's dead, Jim Crow, Jim Crow ain't dead. Jim Crow will never die as long as we have white supremacists who are brought into government. And then when they get stressed, they behave in a way. They don't call it Jim Crow, but they fall back on prior patterns of behavior which are derived from Jim Crow, derived from segregation, derived from racism. Um, so Canada's got a Nazi problem. America's got a racism problem. And uh, that's just- And a, a Nazi a, problem. A In Nazi my problem. opinion, we have a fascist government right now. I think Joe yeah. Biden's a fascist. Well, um, all, I think- certainly no leftist, I'll tell you that. No, there's, there's no such thing as a leftist president. They can't, they wouldn't get elected if they were a leftist president. They That's can right. fake you out like Barack Obama, you know, but um, it wasn't nothing lefty about Barack. He was a uh, old school, you know, classic American establishment figure. I mean, anyway, I don't get yeah, it. Well, he continued all of Bush's policies practically without exception. So I don't really see any difference between him and George. But Bush. he got a Nobel Peace Prize. But he got the Nobel he Peace Prize that, yeah. while bombing the hell out of everybody. <laughs> well, even before, though, he just got it for being. Yeah, just being, right. just being, just being black. Barack Obama, being cool. Here's a Nobel Peace Prize. 
<laughs> yeah. Hey, that works. <laughs> Funny how the ones who deserve a Nobel Peace Prize never seem to get one. How many they years have they been nominating Julian Assange for that? I hope he gets and out of prison are... soon, and I hope he's able to um, get back on his feet and maybe get the recognition he deserves because he does deserve recognition. Yeah, and he deserves freedom. Yeah, we all deserve freedom, but he especially deserves what they're doing to him is just a damn shame. I mean, well, and it set the precedent, Scott, for all of us who are journalists that criticize the establishment, who are not stenographers, who you know, question everything that we're told, research, dig deep, and report to the public what what we see, honestly, is going on. Um, they got it normalized prosecution of journalists who are anti-imperialist. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a chill celebrating effect, for Rick yeah. and for me and everybody right there with Julian. It's a, it's a chilling effect because what happens is young journalists come in and say, I, I, I'd I like to be a Cy Hirsch, but I, I don't want to go to jail. Right. And so they become a Judith Miller instead. And I, I, I mean, Cy is 85 years old and I'm worried for his physical safety right now. I'm worried that they might try to prosecute him or his source. They won't, they won't prosecute Cy. Surely because, they won't come after Cy for goodness and, sake. And, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I'm, I'm sure he's a smart man, but, um, mm. you know, if anybody so touches Julian. their hair, if anybody touches their hair on Cy's head, that'll be, <laughs> no, I won't put up with that. <laughs> you know, he's not Absolutely just a friend, not. but he's the national treasure. He's a national legend. Um, yeah, I'm afraid that would set off a hell of a firestorm if they tried to prosecute Cy for his work. Oh, I can't. He knows. I wouldn't much. put it past him, though. He knows too much. No, he's careful. He's careful. <laughs> he knows too much. He's careful. They see, I mean, again, you know, guys like James Risen. Mm. You know, why did Risen get picked on? Because he ain't a good journalist. If he was a good journalist, they would have never been able to find his source. Exactly. James Risen sucks as a journalist. Why did Judith Miller get singled out? Because she sucks as a journalist. Because when she writes things, she couldn't hide who her source was. She's sloppy. You can't prosecute Cy Hirsch because you don't know who his source is. And you will never know who his source is. Uh, when the day comes, and I hope it's many, many years from now, when Cy passes on to the great, you know, news agency in the sky, um, you're never going to know who his sources were because he's that <laughs> damn good. So you're not going to be able to prosecute Cy because in order to prosecute, you got to have a hook. And uh, they don't have a hook. They, got they ain't nothing. got nothing. They ain't got nothing. They ain't got nothing. Well, Scott, uh, you've been so generous with your time. Once again, thank you for coming in with us tonight. Um, it's always such a joy to have you. I could just talk to you all night long, but I know you probably got things to do. And Maverick, is, is Maverick going to make an appearance on Maverick News? You got him <laughs> locked out of the room right now. I got to see wife, Maverick. I, mean, this I think is my Maverick wife News. took him upstairs to try and keep him from barking and disrupting. Uh, we, had a, we, had a, we had a, a major incident under uh, on, on Judge Nap uh, Napolitano's show. Oh, where, I saw um, that. <laughs> yeah, Magic Maverick went uh, berserk, and um, and 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 there was a lot of hate mail. So, um, oh. out of respect for the judge, um, I we, we we are doing our best to uh, to prevent another Maverick meltdown. <laughs> so, <laughs> Maverick the dog, he is cute though. I know y'all have probably seen him before. Well, I have to yeah. tell you, I, I'm I'm grateful for you having uh, the trust in in us to share your personal story tonight too um that's a, that's a difficult thing to go through and it i think it's obviously difficult to share that publicly um well it was yeah. but but not anymore i mean because that's i finally figured out that that's what they want they want you to feel shame yes and they want you to run away from the titles and to avoid and my whole thing is you know one i don't have anything to be ashamed of i mean not criminally i mean everybody's got something to be ashamed of but um i got nothing to be ashamed of on that i'm not going to run away from the time i'm not going to avoid you guys want to do it let's do it uh, because i got nothing to hide 
literally nothing to hide. The entire case is out there. The court records are out there. I am sitting on a whole bunch of stuff that puts it all into perspective. So I'm better armed. Uh, if any journalist wants to play gotcha on that, I do have my five questions I will ask them in public. And when they can't ask them, I'll tell them to get the F out of my face because you're not a journalist confronting me with a story you haven't even done the basic research on. Get the F out of here. That's my attitude right now. If you're responsible and you want to have a responsible discussion, you have a legitimate concern, as you guys did tonight, let's have that conversation. And I won't get defensive. I'll be honest. I'll talk about anything you want to talk about. But if you're trying to hurt me and hurt my family, uh, and which is that's all they're trying to do is try and play a game of gotcha. You can't get me, guys. There's nothing. I'm hiding nothing. There's no gotcha here. Scott, what about that? There ain't no what about that. It's all there. It's all there. So why run? Why hide? That's what they want you to do. They want you to disappear. They want me to go away. That's right. I ain't going nowhere. So, um, you know, Good you. call me all the names you want. Water off a duck's back. You can't hurt me. You can't hurt my family. You've tried. We're tired of playing that game. We're moving forward. And, and you've um, got so much support, too. I, if well, anything, it helps. maybe it the helps last month has support. shown you how many yeah. people really do love you and support you out there. That's one of the great. forward with this, uh, yeah. this plan for 2024, June 2024, you know, we'll, we'll certainly do everything we can up here to help you get the message out and, uh, and get Canada on side, too. That we'll, we'll, we need yeah. Canada. <laughs> we need Where everybody. Do we need Canada. <laughs> we need everybody. So, no, thank you for that. And again, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come on here. It's because of shows like this that um, that I feel empowered to uh, to confront this head on because it's a tough thing. Um, and if you don't have a base, if you don't have a foundation of support, if you don't have a you know uh, the ability to, to to take the blow and fall back and absorb the blow. Uh, it's daunting to try and fight something of this scope and scale. So there is a tendency just to say, Shh, we're just going to let sleeping dogs lie and I'll just try and earn a living this way. One of the great things that happened because of this Russian invasion is um, I, I became a name. I didn't want to become a name. Trust me, the last thing I want to do is become a name. But I became a name. Um, I didn't want to speak at that rally, but I, I, I said I would. But I knew what was going to happen. And I'm sort of grateful it happened. In many ways, I guess I should thank Scott Horton and the Libertarian Party, because what you did is you don't get to play that card anymore. I'm not playing your game. You put it all out there thinking that I was going to be embarrassed and I was going to walk away and I was going to hide. And I'm not. Um, so thank you, Scott Horton. Thank you, Libertarian Party. I appreciate it because uh, now I just don't care. I don't care what you call me. Uh, because it's not true. And there's enough people out there right now, because I'm not running away from it, who are saying it ain't true. And at some point in time, there's gonna, it's going to reach critical mass where sufficient number of people say it ain't true. It's no longer a weapon. A weapon doesn't work unless it cuts. You well, you know, what it. really made me mad as a libertarian of many, many years is the Libertarian Party is not the party. It's not our business to be the the speech police or even yeah. the morality police morality police. No, I mean, no, we are the party that ran John McAfee as a presidential candidate in 2016. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we're usually not big. On, we're the party that wants to legalize all drugs and prostitution. So we are definitely not in the business of policing morality, but all of a sudden we make an exception for you, Scott. And that just didn't make any sense to me. And it angered me. I know you, I know the case, I've studied it, I know that the whole thing was a bunch of hooey, that they're doing this, again, to, you know, to try and delegitimize you and what yeah. you're saying and distract from your message. So I think it's really big of you that you didn't sue the Libertarian Party. Uh, I understand that the stopping this war is more important. You're right. And I think it's very big of you that you still support the rally, even after all that they did to you personally. And thank you for coming on Sunday. Um, and, you know, you're doing the right thing. And I salute you. Well, thank you very much. And again, thank Rick and thank Lori for having me on. Uh, it's an honor and a privilege to be here with you guys. And uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime. Maybe not Anytime. for three hours and 50 minutes, but. <laughs> <laughs> Did we do that again? 
Well, no, you, I, I think you guys did an hour first. So yeah, that's I was on that for an hour beforehand. Only two hours and 50 minutes. <laughs> no, the privilege is ours. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Okay, well, thank, thanks a lot, guys. And have a great night. And, um, you too. See you around. Okay, see sir. You. Bye, Scott. Bye. Okay, I got to get my cursor to work. There we go. <laughs> have a good night. Okay, see you. <laughs> that was awesome. Woo, isn't he something? He is. Just yeah. love the man. That, you know, that um, that's an incredible story that he shared. Um, I can tell you, you know, the first time we had him on the program, as soon as I announced it, people started sending me messages. You can't have him on the show. And they started mm -hmm. sending me the links and the da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. I'd already looked at it. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I just kind of brushed it off because it's this, the same old stuff, you know? Um, so there you are. And uh, we are still on the air. Just so you know, there, Laurie. Uh, in case, uh, in case you're not my aware, my camera just died. Hold on a second. Yeah. yeah Damn cats! <laughs> See, I need to lock them up. Cats like are like ca camera saboteurs. <laughs> they are. They're professionals at this. <laughs> <laughs> I'm but, trying to uh, reboot the camera, but I think I don't know. We'll just keep talking. Uh, I, I'll be yeah. Spock's brain. <laughs> There you go. Spock's brain again. Spock's brain again. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was a, 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 an amazing personal story. It was. Um, I, I honestly, I, I knew that you might touch on that tonight, but I didn't expect to get that much detail. Me neither. He told some parts of the story that are not public and have never been known before. And I've studied the case upside and down, but there were details there that, that he had never revealed to anyone. That's I almost true. feel like, yeah. you know, like he got this big confession off his chest and yeah. he feels better. Yeah. And if we could help him do that, that's, that's pretty cool, huh? Yeah. Yeah. He's uh he's a treasure. He is. Yeah, he is. And my libertarian party made a huge mistake canceling this man from the rage against war machine rally Sunday. And I hope that somebody out there in the libertarian party watched this broadcast tonight. And I hope that they took Scott's words to heart and uh, I hope that they re-extend that invitation for the third time <laughs> and not chicken out, not change their minds and not be bullied by the mob, not be dragged along by the, the gusts of wind and just, you know, take a stand, be firm, and stand with this man because he deserves support. That's my take on it. Well, with that, we will wrap up for the night. Everybody, thank yeah, you. Yeah, I guess so. My camera's here. dead. We'll yeah. call it a night. Um, <laughs> my cat killed my camera. <laughs> um, At least you waited until Scott left, though. Yeah. That would have been terrible. So, so thank you, Maverick family, new viewers, wherever you're tuning in from tonight tuning in i'm so old um <laughs> don't touch that dial don't touch that uh, dial <laughs> we'll, we'll all be back tomorrow 6 p.m eastern standard time um on, be on behalf of myself and spock's brain <laughs> <laughs> thank you see you tomorrow good night Dave. this has been a maverick multimedia production